correct uh i think i think it was more fun when we were meeting in person but uh, this pandemic has pushed us to do it virtually and we are conducting it successfully you know second time in this uh, uh, pandemic situation uh, so my name is manoj kumar i am the head of information technology at hpcl mittal energy limited and as part of uh, indus uh, we welcome you all and especially our you know the new the first time uh, members Uh, like uh, gspc opal you know those members who have joined it first time so i welcome you all for this special interest group of oil and gas so i'll just quickly touch base you know what is this indus and what all we do so indus stands for indian users of sap those companies who are using sap and what is a sap user group it's an independent community it is for customer by customer of customers and it, it indicates the market maturity in the sense uh, sap is present in 180 plus countries and only 46 user groups are there where india is also part of uh, user groups it shows the user groups exist where the market is more mature and why do we need a user group so basically the purpose of user group is to convergence of industries where various industries can come together they can share their ideas they can share their technological advances what they have done and various emerging business model also out of the technology what various business models are emerging mm. people can share and leverage from each other's the, knowledge uh, slide up yeah. to keep that uh, 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 yeah. objectives yeah. the industry was formed to collaborate yeah. to yeah. co-innovate and to influence also where as a group we influence sap for licensing or for some other you know development for the localization so that's the purpose of the industry and we collaborate with sap customers the way we are doing today with sap business unit with in, in sap also you know different business units are there for cloud there is a business unit for ariba there is a business unit for concord there is a separate business so within business unit also with sap we collaborate and of course with sap partners also so through indus it helps us in collaborating with these three people three communities and co innovate with sap product team sap consulting and with sap partners and influence as indus we influenced for the product policy and strategy not only at local level at a global level also with local regional and global leadership we keep on influencing as a group we keep on meeting them and as a partner ecosystem also as far as the indus status is concerned we there are 1500 customer member and total we have 5000 plus individual member and in as indus we are member of sujan which is sap user group executive network so indus is also member of sujan and this indus is enabled through various councils special interest group and chapters so uh, in terms of councils let's say we have a licensing councils where you if if somebody is facing some problem you know we can uh, uh, we can uh, guide them we can direct them what is right or wrong we have a board member there are 12 board members uh, from various industries and uh, from oil and gas myself and vikas prabhu from nasi i of the naira energy we represent uh, indus board and various special interest groups are in action let's like, say oil and gas is one of the most vibrant and uh, you know energetic i would say the interest group where a lot of interaction happens among the uh, peer industries the same way on the automotive side the utility is retail so so many inter in special interest groups are, are active through indus and on the functional side you know uh, the special interest group for hr procurement innovation of the transformation and few interest groups what we are planning uh, on the manufacturing side supply chain side it side and the marketing and the sales side on the product side the special interest group are for s4 hana for cloud platform sap alm sap enterprise support sap globalization sap licensing and sap security so these are the various special interest group so i would request if uh, the way you are part of the special interest group of oil and gas if something excites you uh, let's say in hr procurement or maybe on the product side do become the member of interest so that you get latest update and you interact with various communities we have various chapters in metros delhi mumbai uh, chennai kolkata and we have hubs in uh, pune hyderabad and bangalore 
and in the towns like Kochi, Ahmedabad, and Coimbatore. So these are the chapters active for industry. So if uh, some of you are not member of INDUS, I request to join uh, as member of the interest so you can be part of this community where you can share the ideas, what all you have, uh, you know, technological advancement you have done in your respective, and you can hear from other industries also because each industry, each company is taking their own action on this digital transformation journey and SAP being a core system, the digital core system, you know, we can leverage the knowledge of each other. So I sincerely request if you're not member of uh, INDUS, do join us. And you can find more information on the newly launched website, www.industcommunity.com. So I think that's all from my side and the state where we can come to the agenda. And on behalf of Indus, I welcome you all for uh, another two and a half hour, you know, the productive uh, uh, workshop, what we are going to do. So, Over to you, uh, Yeah, thanks, Monoj. Uh, just confirm, uh, whether I'm audible and you can see my screen. Yeah, we can see your screen and you're very much audible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just a quick, uh, so I will not take much of a time because already we are behind it. So we had a discussion, we had a last meeting in the month of May and uh, as an outcome of it, we also took a pulse survey and in the pulse survey, few things came out very uh, visibly. One was that what are the, and at the time the lockdown had just started and people were actually struggling to uh, find it out what best can be done. So some of the priorities which were there during the lockdown, which still continues, but gradually we see some easing, is that uh, what is that uh, was the top of the priority? Priority was around the mobile applications, which has to be developed. So on the same note, we are going to present a co-innovation uh, application, which is getting discussed and developed by SAP along with HMEL, it's, a, it's an outcome of the last discussion. And what were the top priorities which the industry will focus after the lockdown is or near the closure of the lockdown is was on business process optimization. And a topic which we had selected around it is on the WhatsApp integration chatbot. Few of the topics which you uh, uh, all has mentioned that these were the priorities they, that which they wanted to hear in the industry forum and more, I think more we will get it added also after uh, today's session. So uh, where around the project management, intelligent asset management, customer, uh, uh, customer uh, excellence, and uh, of course on the innovations which are there on the cl cloud platform. So based on that, what we have decided is that we went to, we uh, uh, do, did a bucketing of those uh, <clears throat> feedbacks. And based on that, we, what we have done is that we have created four themes. And the themes will be on capital project management and excellence. Second theme, which will be after this, maybe after one quarter or thing, will be on intelligent manufacturing and asset management. Third will be customer engagement. And fourth will be financial excellence. Uh, apologies to the HR team that we have not yet uh, conceived a theme for HR, but yes, we should also do that. And this is the way we are going to arrange the subsequent industry sessions. Uh, quickly, uh, although during the registration, you must have seen this, uh, I will not take much of a time. So over to you, I just, with that, I hand it over to uh, Sai and Ashutosh. You please come down and start sharing the innovation uh, topic, which has been done on uh, the electronic proof of delivery app. So with that, I welcome Sai and Ashutosh. Please join. Yep. Hello everyone, I'm sharing my screen. Let me know if it is visible or not. Yeah, it's visible. Yeah, you can go ahead. Ash, uh, I hope Ashutosh, you are also there. Yes, Libda, thank you. Yeah, I'm please here. start. Please start. Yeah. So, good afternoon, all. Uh, they said Ashutosh Garg here. I'm from HPCL Mitter Energy. I'm looking after here sales and distribution and the mobility track. So as part of the co-innovation, uh, what's the problem that we have discussed with SAP is the uh, proof of delivery management. That is the problem that we are facing. So how we have built up, how we have given the problem case, this is just the, the uh, gist of that. So as per the industry, what figure we have taken that is 7 million plus approximate trips are performed monthly carrying all the petroleum commodities from the refinery. 
so this is the you know the uh, the comet that we are talking about sai next please so some of the facts if i'll talk about on an average uh, our truck spends 10 to 20% of the its time at the loading point and at the discharging point while the remaining 60 to 80% is in the in transit where the our uh, particular truck is going to the customer place and then coming back to the refinery with physical proof of delivery document oil companies most of the oil companies i'm talking about have deployed the state of our technologies while automating their loading to invoicing processes but still the visibility of the operation at customer end is still lacking what we are targeting here next please sai so there was a survey in trucking companies have shown that the the consignment rejection and disputes are up to a tune of the 1 to 2% that is also quite huge uh, from the perspective of the oil and gas companies the experience between the the carrier to to customer consignment transition you know this is can be improved uh, by the digital intervention where we can give the tracking to each of the stakeholder at each at each, each and every given point of time next please no what we are saying here is the reduced transit risk of material being lost in transit that's why if we are you know improving the visibility of the in transit process to every stakeholder we are certainly lessening the chances of the material being lost in transit and thus later on we can save on the insurance cost see every material which is being transit is having the insurance and that's a cost to the company so later on we can save on this cost what we are introducing new here is the carrier scoring mechanism is the way where you know the customer can give the feedback of the driver of the transporter where can be you know uh, taken into the account to deliver the to judge the service quality of the transporter and thereby they can judge and further actions can be taken uh, where while we are empanning the transporters what we are targeting is the improvement of the pud cycle time that is you know uh, from quite 30 days to the transit time half of that maybe the 15 days so yes what are the challenges that we are facing so this is the process that we are explaining here what is pod is the certification of the completion of the delivery of the material from consignee to the transporter and the intent to the supplier it is being delivered at a stipulated time if not then it certainly captures the date of the delivery it has endorsement from the both transporters and the consignment as an acknowledgement yes the material has been received in good conditions or in certain uh, you know bad conditions some material is wet some material is not received in proper quality or some material is lo lost in between so that is the kind of the certification and it gives the detail of the vehicle and material and detail of the shipment for freight payables next please so what are the challenges that we are facing as a company with the, this physical uh, proof of delivery process that we are following now first is the loss of the pud documents see handling of the physical documents is always very very cumbersome and there are the chances where this uh, physical pud document is being lost there are chances also when there is a dispute of a delivery maybe it has reached delayed it has reached late or there is a short quantity then this pud pud is lost then again confirming to the consignee you know make the cycle all lengthy and this in turn makes the payment of the transporter a uh, delay there is a time lag between the time of the delivery and the pud con confirmation at at certain point of time as a supplier you no know, i want to pay uh, my transporter on time but until unless the pud comes to me i cannot process that this is the biggest challenge and we want to reduce this cycle time there are tempering of the pods yes the the you know cost uh, uh, textual overwriting is quite very often when there is such a case we need to confirm back to the consignee we need to confirm back to the transporter so again which it delays the entire cycle there are cases of trans shipment where you know uh, the vehicle is being offloaded from a truck and being loaded into other type of the truck though after the introduce of the ebay bill they have to generate another ebay bill with the correct uh, uh, vehicle number but 
that information doesn't flow back to the supplier maybe i have given a certain kind of a discount or certain kind of a freight premium for a certain particular vehicle type so that information has to come to the supplier there are such chances of human error while we are entering pod information manually into the sap so there are the challenges that we are facing with physical pod processes next please sai yeah so hello everyone i am sai prakash i work as solution advisor for user experience and innovation at sap and thanks to ashutosh for explaining about the scenario as well as the various challenges with the proof of delivery now i'll take you through how we came up to a solution and what exactly is that solution so let us first talk about what was our approach our approach was simple deliver clear outcomes in every phase of discover design and deliver and in the discover phase as we gain the deep understanding it helps us further to design and deliver let's talk about the design process that we followed so we try to understand the use case properly with the help of current environment current challenges as well the first insights now this lead us to identify our personas which were and their key task that was further used to create the scenario and wireframes and after validation we came up with high fidelity mockups and the guidelines so we identify personas based on the delivery process and for that before we we'll let's talk about the use case which ashutosh will just explain in some time so ashutosh over to you thanks sai so the use case is that uh, how you know the this product might help hmel in optimizing total turnaround time of the cycle of the delivery to payment enabling transparent and quick dispute resolution and take an effective decision making and real time insight for every the stakeholders involved in this uh, entire cycle that is the customers drivers transporter so that everybody would have a better delivery experience yeah yes thank Over you so these were the personas the driver transporter warehouse operator the terminal operator and quality expert now these can be changed based on different scenarios so suppose here the warehouse operator is also uh, one of the employees for the customer or it can be the customer itself who is receiving the terminal manager operate manager or the operator he is the decision making authority in case of disputes so this can also be changed or configured as well as the quality expert can be other stakeholders who are part of the dispute resolution process so once we identified their key task each personas and we created the wireframes and scenarios this lead us to the following mockups for each of these personas so you can see the driver app which can help manage trips and track disputes it the transporter app that help them to track trips respond to dispute as well as view customer feedback and analytics there was warehouse operator who can get trip updates race track and response to disputes the terminal manager can manage all operation get insights as well as he can handle the dispute just by a chatbot our quality expert was to provide quality inputs and update in the case of disputes so what does the epoch solution exactly come up with so now each of the apps help the respective personas in performing their key activities in the dispute resolution process as well as other activities and they combine together as one solution that help each stakeholder to track dispute in real time and update their progress so that there is no discrepancy with geo fencing the company get real time insights and truthful information about the delivery time and the pod consumption with machine learning and advanced analytics as well as natural language processing combined with the chatbot we were able to provide decision making capabilities to terminal manager to retrieve and update information in real time qr code based document exchange this enables digital transfer digital transfer of documents now pod can also be sent to mail and further posted to sap systems without any errors using either irpa so this was our architecture on which our solution was based on so now you can see that the data from the erp systems comes to sap cloud connector which can be used by different applications that are built and they are consuming our mobile services the chatbot for terminal manager is powered by sap conversational ai 
machine learning services and analytics which are running on top of SCP. They provide and consume data from the ERP system as well as the O data services from HAN. So let me take you through a short demo of the driver application as it will not be possible to show all the applications in the short time. So for a minute, you will be having the view of the driver application. So this was a demo for the driver application. Now, this solution can also be further customized, scaled and extended along with its existing capabilities. So with every delivery, the feedback from customer is taken, which helps us to further analyze and process in terms of ratings for the driver as well as the transporters. Now these ratings are fed to the transporter as to terminal manager for better decision making. So you can see the screens for transporter. He can see his ratings as well as his drivers. The terminal manager can see all the ratings for the transporter on demand whenever it's needed. You must be thinking, how will the drivers use this application if they don't know English or if they don't have a high end device? Well, do not worry. This can easily be configured for multiple languages and devices. As you can see, the screens are converted into Hindi language. While you'll also be thinking, what about different type of products? Well, that can also be customized to suit products like grade of uh, polypropylene, quality and quantity parameters, as well as stakeholders for the process. Now I'd like to hand over to Ashutos for concluding our presentation. Thank you, Sai. So, uh, you know, from this uh, co-innovation product, what are the industry benefits and key takeaways for us is obviously we are leveraging the SAP Cloud platform in the latest technologies to support uh, this last mile delivery with the efficient and the quick decision making and transparent to everyone in the entire cycle. That is the easy integration at customer, supplier and transporter. And so we are connecting all three parties, which are the integral part of this whole system and yes this this can be extendable and scalable to other industries like steel or other involving any kind of shipment or transportation what we have you know uh, kept also here the simple ux for the drivers to operate and there are qr based technologies for the document exchange so yes that is it so yeah, that's all from our presentation. If you want to reach us or if you hand up any questions, feel free to ask now. You can also reach us using our email address, which I have been provided here. Thank you. Thank you, Sai. Thank you, Sandeep. Thanks, Sandeep. Okay. Thanks, Sai. Thanks, Asutosh. I think uh, if there are any questions, uh, it may be asked now or it can be posted on chat or already we will be sharing you the slides also. Definitely there will be, if there is any other uh, organization which also wants to uh, include their innovations in this application, then you are welcome. Uh, with that, I uh, welcome Abhik uh, Chatterjee to join and uh, present his session on uh, uh, technology intervention in capital project management in oil to chemical value chain. So uh, short introduction, Abhik uh, comes from BCG, he's a senior partner over there and has got uh, tremendous experience in utilities and oil to chemicals value chain. 
including uh, capital project management. So what do you have? Uh, thank you. Can all of you hear me well? Yeah, we can. Okay, fabulous. Uh, first of all, thank you to the INDUS group for, uh, for, for providing me the privilege. Indeed, an honor to be part of this group. And um, I must compliment you for a, for a very nice solution and a demonstration that you just concluded. <clears throat> So I'll take, uh, um, I know uh, we were supposed to start at 2.20, but if it is okay, uh, Sandeep and team, I'll take 20 minutes. Is that time appropriate or do I need to- Yeah, 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 we can, we can, yeah. Okay, sure. 20 minutes. So, 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 so let me take 20 minutes and uh, uh, within that much time, I'll at least try to share with you some of our, and my personal experiences of, of, uh, uh, of doing digital, more specifically on in the oil and gas. And um, as Sandeep set it out uh, with a little bit of flavor and focus uh, around the uh, around the capital capital project or the large project space. Uh, so my name is Abhik, as, as Sandeep introduced, I'm a managing director partner based out of our uh, India office, Bangalore. Um, and I've served clients in the oil and gas, uh, chemicals and natural resources space for close to 12 plus years now, and uh, uh, very specifically uh, focusing on digital. So if I if I move on, uh, and what I'll do is I'll run for maybe uh, 13 to 15 minutes and keep the balance five minutes for Q&A, if that is okay. So we are discussing large projects. Um, I know the topic is around digital and technology, but um, I think uh, it is a it is a it is a largely very complex space that we operate in the capital project or large project space, as we say. Um, going back to a lot of research and work that we do in this space, potentially large projects are one of the most challenging. And, um, and, and I think that's why they are called large projects. So if you just look at in terms of the kind of risk it holds, uh, at an average 50 or 50% 50 of them uh, result in approximately a 1.75x in terms of cost, which means you're leaking 75% uh, estimate any which ways over and above what you're supposed to spend. Over 60% are delayed by over a year. So uh, typically the odds are, uh, are, are not stacked very favorably. And if you look at this chart, and I don't intend to uh, do a detail here, but clearly North America scores significantly high as it relates to just the quantum of project overrun, the, the, the percentage of projects. While if you look at Asia Pacific and even North America to some extent, a lot of the oil and gas projects or even chemicals projects or large projects, I mean, we, we just tend to leak a lot of time. So that is, that is one starting perspective on the complexity that we are talking about. If we then look at the second factor and, and um, I think COVID is not any more new to any of us, I think we will forever in our life remember this year for the way it has, I would say, shaped or, or normalized our careers, ways of work, future of work, so on and so forth. But if you look at the right hand side of the chart here, it has been simply catastrophic for a lot of the large projects that companies have run, the way they have spent, and more importantly, a good number of countries just survive on on oil and if you look at the top half corner it includes essentially a good set of the gulf countries uh, wherein the amount of impact it has had both from margin uh, both from uh, uh, the kind of capex reductions have been significant and then if you normalize that more specifically from a from a large what i would say a uh, global super major perspective. So between Exxon, Chevron, BP, Total, and Shell, they would shave off roughly 35 to $50 billion of CAPEX, which was outlay, which, which had an outlay specifically for this year. I mean, and obviously year on year going forward. So that is a significant impact, correct? And, uh, and, what, and what it has also meant, so one is on a financial and from a risk perspective, but what COVID has also meant is from a tactical on-ground execution perspective, there's been a significant shortage of labor uh, on the ground, availability of experts, 
uh, more importantly, I think it has just exposed us to a supply chain risk and an imbalance, which is just throwing the entire ecosystem in a very different kind of spin. And I'm going to talk to you about some of them and how are organizations applying digital in that space. Okay. So this is lever number two, right? So we spoke about just how intrinsically this risky are large projects. Secondly, how has COVID, COVID been just so uh, drastic in its impact? And then uh, just as a, a shorter addition to that, we conducted, uh, I mean, BCG conducted a, a, a survey with some of our large projects and respondents. And clearly, as you see, 90% uh, of organizations are are seeing capex as a lever to cut so in addition to regular cost cuts looking at deferment of payment new ways of contracting the entire capex area is something that will heavily come under the hammer and if you look at oil and gas it is even more acute and drastic just because of the way crude has behaved and stuff around that if you look at infrastructure or some other players like mining i mean beyond the point they don't have an option because that's just part and parcel of of, of how they work through but if we look at oil and gas, it's been it's it's been it's been quite significant. Now we come to the last dimension, and and obviously that's that's a part of what we will touch upon, is what we call a, is is the digital angle, right? So I mean there have been great digital advancements that have happened across organization, but within oil and gas, and specifically if we look at more specifically within the project side. I think we are still yet to see digital creating that kind of ripple at scale. And when I say that kind of ripple at scale, I'm not talking about obviously specific interventions of certain mobility or certain types of analytics, maybe on the procurement risk contract, some bit definitely advancements we've made on the operation side. But if you largely look at organizations, if you look at a gap between uh, organizations on whether they have a digital strategy or not and most oil companies uh, medium to large definitely have one almost with 90 percent plus coverage most of them also have senior leaders who are tasked to drive that through but what we are seeing is scaling significant value from digital and when i'm talking about significant value assume that you have a pnl mandate of 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 driving a 500 crore or 1000 crore benefit from digital over a two or a three year ambition uh, and you could normalize that basis the, the, the revenue starting point uh, for oil and gas is yet to happen. We have seen that in a few other industries and as you see on the left hand side of the chart here this is a uh, this is a benchmarking exercise that we do called digital acceleration index which just which for example maps upstream more so in this case versus uh, and then you also see the normalized power utilities, uh, 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 public sector and few others. So while FinTech obviously as expected is on the far right, um, uh, we have a little bit of catch up to do. Okay, so that being said, I think today uh, my, uh, my intent would not be to really talk to you about, uh, okay, these are these two use cases on blockchain or quantum compute or um, or for example, on a couple of use cases on AI and ML. But I want to take a very pragmatic lens. I want to take a pragmatic and practitioner lens of, as you look at excelling in projects and large projects or, or CAPEX, whichever word you want to use, uh, there are three lenses that come. And in those three lenses, what can you do from a digital perspective? And as I talk to you through the three lenses and the digital perspective, those are actual steps or what we would say initiatives in some cases also transformations that a number of the companies have taken uh, some in india many outside as well uh, in order to really a not only survive but also excel and then grow in this heavily heavily challenged environment so if we look at those three lenses number one is what does it take to really survive in this condition right which is as a project, how do you look at your portfolio? How do you measure risk? How do you look at cost analytics? So on and so forth. So, so, so what's the, what's the thinking brain that you apply? And increasingly that's become the heart and soul of analytics to really double down heavily. So if you talk of how AI ML can disrupt this space, 
I think to me that is really around assessing the market conditions, knowing the implications right from your supply end to your execution side, and then taking a call in terms of how do you want to accelerate, decelerate, put on hold, uh, et cetera. So that is number one. Number two gets to slightly more operational, which is how does a project adapt to the on-ground realities? So we have got into a lot of remote work. Uh, we have also got into uh, the, what we would say, the target work population available to us changing, depending upon site, depending upon location, depending upon expertise, EPC, et cetera, at a variable basis, because uh, some, an expert unfortunately could be COVID positive, which would render him out of practice or out of work. How would you do? And how would you really, how would you really be re nimble and dynamic in terms of work execution, monitoring, so on and so forth. And lastly, what are some of the broader strategy setups that you would have in order to manage systems, people, processes, etc. Okay. So I will, I will spend a good amount of time on one and two and then slightly lesser on three, but I think one and two is, is where really the action has been. So, so let's start with one, which is how do you really take that bird's eye view? So what I'm showing you has been uh, a good amount of, so when COVID struck and this was uh, third week, end of March scenario, and it, it unfortunately has been down in from there on, most organizations scrambled to set up what they would call as a COVID response cell, et cetera. Many large project organizations also set up uh, what they would call as their response cell or their command center control tower, whatever it is. And hence this entire project and portfolio control analytics became very key. Now, one could easily argue that, okay, what is the kind of real time data that you have? In a project environment, the real time data is definitely a, what I would say a challenge, but there is still a good amount of data available if you carefully scrape through. So there are some bit of production logs, there is movement information, there is planning schedule, uh, confirmation, it may not be really in the shape that you may want it to be, but it, but there is at least something for you to play with. Now, most organizations that I know, or many for that matter, very quickly put a set of analytics in play, uh, in the form of project and portfolio and analytics, which essentially allowed them to look at which projects are really, uh, which, which projects are really good, which products are bleeding because this is a time where you make a few hard calls in terms of are there projects that are really sinking, wherein the significant amount of uh, uh, a risk on the other side, you're already committed for a lock-in, uh, or are they low criticality, little bit of exposure, so on and so forth. There were also projects that need to be accelerated because it just give you very rapid payback because it is very clear that whilst it is a tough duration, but this too shall pass and hence, a lot of organizations with a with a decent view of cash have ensured that they have they have they have not really completely paused but they may have slowed down a little bit but they have ensured that the turbine or the engine kind of slowly is checking along at the back end also a preferential view of what to stop uh, some bit of maintenance etc wherein the business case is no longer valid so overall the project and the portfolio uh, a view has been quite powerful it, is, it essentially started with a lot of infra players in India and the region doing it at pace. And then uh, at, in the oil and gas space, we also picked it up. So, so that is number one. Number two uh, is a piece of work that we have been supporting for a while. And uh, this is with an upstream company within our region. And uh, so, I mean, the, the view was that number of rigs to be drilled, uh, a good number of wells, almost 30 or 35 that were there. Uh, tree delivery was betting, becoming delayed just because of the time it was taking on the contractual model, uh, et cetera. So what we wanted to do was really optimize this planning drilling activity. And obviously I've put it under the, although you can debate that, does it come really under projects? Partly yes, partly no, it could come more under operations. But I thought I'll include it here because this included a view of really forecasting uh, a, a holistic tree model using Monte Carlo and really identifying what kind of planning drilling activity optimization you could do. And then at the back of it, having really the view of what is the kind of contracting term methodology you would use that becomes quite influential, right? 
because here you are leading with analytics and you are taking definitive calls on certain contracts wherein some of them are extended by 7 to 15 months to that extent uh, in order to essentially just ensure that you don't fall into a period of recontracting risk which is also something that has opened up for our clients and what it meant for uh, this specific company was a good amount of value leakage that was uh, that was adopt, uh, that was avoided to the tune of uh, uh, nearly 20 million us moving on so if you if i just take a uh, uh, take a reflection back i think as you see the first two use cases classically more on it monitoring control tower also uh, also looking at the overall project portfolio um, as well as uh, some bit of drilling or activity type of optimization i then get into the next part which is uh, covid unfortunately has exposed us to a real big risk on the supply side and as you see on this chart it shows by each of the geographies what are really some of the most high risk categories so within asia pacific we typically see rigs drilling well etc as one of the top ones uh, top side and processing as well and and i've taken specifically an upstream part here we could easily do one for a pet chem or a chemicals flow chain as well but just the entire upstream capex side is is slightly more complex and interesting and hence i use this but this is one view that it is the supply side is becoming really really uh, uh, fraught with risk and it is also introducing significant type of distress so one thing we have realized is we are entering into a situation because of just the entire consumer demand as well as the access that roughly 45 to 50 percent of our suppliers globally across the world may just not be able to survive the covid lockdown more importantly also the barrel price that it is accompanying along with it so they will come and what has happened over the last few weeks as you must have read a lot of large companies have already filed uh, uh, for unfortunately bankruptcy in number of cases, many of them have have uh, uh, have liquidated their assets. So we are getting into a business side which is slightly not so pleasant. Uh, we are also seeing this will trigger obviously uh, a price reduction uh, over the next uh, six to twelve, maybe even further on. And obviously, what it will also mean to some extent is it will disrupt some of our simple logistics. For example, access to experts, uh, shipment of spares, uh, uh, availability of vendors to be, uh, especially because there's a lot of offshore field services work that happens, so on and so forth. So how do you then balance it? And I'm, I'll just quickly move on for the sake of time. How do you then balance it? I think one way that we are increasingly doing is applying, at least in the project space, a lot of shoot cost analytics. Uh, this essentially, uh, I mean, as you see on this page, this is just a quick view of over 12 months, right from drilling to turbines to transformers, valves, pipes. At an average, you will see anywhere between an 8 to 20 percent type of reduction happening, which is something that will become very, very critical for our clients to absorb within their project financials and also ultimately into the bottom line. And what this means is you really need smart level of analytics and some bit of AI ML to really know how could you forecast shoot costs over a period of time and then link it back to your overall project financials. This typically gets complex. A lot of time happens through manual and large Excel, in some cases through also some, some simple algorithms. But the need to kind of get this through a structured manner because you are going to expose more categories. You are going to then develop more what we would say optimization positions or scenarios and then in accordance kind of uh, run this through. So although this may be put under control tower, but this clearly is something that is linked to supplier risk, vendor risk, commodity risk and the entire way you would link it back into project financials, project analytics. And as you would see, a good amount of this data potentially sits within SAP, out of SAP and the need to conjure both of them together in order to drive that high level of predictive, accurate forecast becomes very critical. Moving on, so that, that was the first part, which is how can you be really strategic? How can you really look forward, run a lot of analytics right from a project portfolio, commodity spend price level? The second part is how do you then tactically enable a lot of this stuff on the ground, right? 
Now, there are many examples of this. I think there was one very valuable example just shown a while back, wherein uh, you, had a, you had a nice app uh, uh, that helps you really uh, take a process forward. Uh, in addition to that, um, what we are also seeing is um, uh, a lot of apps around logistics, offshore movement, milk run optimization, et cetera, being done. Uh, either they are done in SAP, they are some of, many of them are done in custom uh, programs, whichever way is easier for the organization or based on the licenses that are available. And it is giving organizations anywhere between three to 12% savings or, or rather an opportunity to better negotiate what they have. In some cases, it just allows the vendor to perform better, although you may just continue at the same rate. Uh, digital twin is becoming something quite handy. Uh, especially as it relates to optimization scenarios. And we are seeing that drive uh, at an average anywhere between anywhere up to five to 7% reduction in operating expenses as well. The third aspect is around enabling productivity. And in our industry within CAPEX and within oil and gas, there is a huge, what we would say value of, uh, uh, of, of seasoned experts to, 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 to give their inputs or to help validate or, or coach on certain areas. Uh, which earlier used to be all physical, is now getting into a completely Zoom, Team, Skype, whatever you chose, choose, but into a very hand-on way. Uh, what is also happening is in some cases, uh, especially in more advanced markets, AR, VR is also being uh, leveraged or slowly being piloted for some form of on-ground training wherein uh, capability or talent is becoming an asset, and we are clearly seeing a jump in productivity. It opens up a different aspect around how much is it uh, uh, viable over a longer period of time and what is the impact. Uh, if you keep the question aside, uh, uh, wherein obviously there is a good level of impact, can it improve? Definitely yes. But is it helping me just activate my work for the day, for the week, for the month? Definitely yes. The last part is obviously around not so digital, but it is more around collaboration, which is the entire collaboration that we are now entering into with either contractors, owners, government, because it's like a really distressed environment for everyone. A lot of parties are coming together to really share the risk and share the gains as well. And that is a, either solving for liquidity concerns uh, at the partner vendor side, and also ensuring that within the limited liquidity uh, or the limited, uh, what we would say, opportunities available, how can the best critical parts be, be addressed? So that is point number two. Lastly, I wanted to quickly touch upon how do you, uh, how, how, are you how are you driving analytics for resource planning? I think this is becoming very critical. Um, most of the resource planning that we do in terms of people availability, be it on offshore sites, or even for doing a specific small time projects, are typically, I mean, if it is a larger turnkey project, obviously there is a uh, there is a large partner slash vendor available to manage them, but they themselves are are having challenges in meeting their side. If it is a small one, uh, they they are exposed to just a very different kind of uh, problem as well, and hence uh, there is a huge uh, wave of workforce work planning as well as resource planning uh, uh, analytics and and dynamic allocation which is almost to plan work based on how much is your EPC contractor available and when, what kind of critical path you need to do first, uh, what kind of uh, uh, completions need to happen, and, and for that, what kind of clawback talent that you need and how do you deploy, so all of that. Again, largely driven through Excel for many, many years, even manual or, on, or over phone, slowly begin to be driven through AI and machine learning and some part of analytics. But this obviously, the assumption here is we are getting access to data uh, through some shape or form uh, in order to be slightly dynamic in, in, in running the analytics. Which then takes me to the last point uh, of, uh, of this piece, which is, I mean, we talk about a lot of uh, good stuff on digital, which is, I mean, could be the best stuff around AI ML, around blockchain, IoT, advanced robotics, uh, drone-based surveillance, et cetera. But at a very fundamental data level, we still have a lot of challenges. So I, my humble request uh, uh, to a lot of, I would say, technology leaders as well as business leaders in this room is to, is to have a quick view on where you are really on your data pieces, because a lot of our fancy ambition just takes a very 
uh, nose dive when we realize that the data is just not there. And the second part is what are we really solving for? So either it's a whole bunch of vendor reports, contractor monitoring, certain type of analytics, what your executives wants to see versus what business wants to hear and how are we solving the problem? So I think this entire data to inside chain is becoming very important wherein a lot of organizations are slowly going back to really going back to fundamentals, looking at have I classified my data? What are my data domains? Do they combine together? Can I really run this type of analytics on a day-to-day -day basis if uh, with this kind of data? Is my historic data enough? So on and so forth. So a lot of fundamental questions have got opened up, but the good thing is we are, we are taking a step in the right direction uh, and, and, uh, and carving that through. Lastly, I wanted to share an outside in perspective. I mean, outside in as in more outside of oil and gas is where could oil and gas learn from, especially in the capital project space. I think one good area that oil and gas could potentially learn is from large scale infra players. They are clearly ahead of the journey in large scale projects. So most of the large infra players have something called, I mean, most of them already have a digital strategy roadmap, whatever you call it. They also have the middle layer in terms of some digital information platforms, wherein um, I'm sure if you are in the infra space, you would know a concept called 5D or 7D, which is five dimensional. Uh, they use it in building manufacturing, wherein you can really link on a geospatial map, your design to schedule to cost. So at any point in time, you can know uh, what is the impact of a change of design into schedule and into rupee crore terms as well to obviously asset management and then bidding, et cetera. Uh, most of them have, is, have institutionalized this entire digital impact center of the control tower, which embeds risk, et cetera. And they also use a specific set of tools on their, on their operation side, could be drone-based surveying, et cetera, wireless equipment. And I know within the oil and gas space, we have specific uh, uh, compliance and guidelines of what kind of equipment, uh, zone one, zone two, et cetera, that are there. And lastly, analytics and simulation. So I think there's a good structure that we have seen infra players drive, which I believe our oil and gas, uh, we in oil and gas can really derive on and, uh, and, 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 and drive through. So lastly, I think in closing um, three points uh, to keep in view, and these are more in terms of moments of truth for the next uh, six to 12 months. Uh, I think there'll be a lot of survival challenge. So we need to hard look through analytics back into our portfolio and make some hard calls, um, looking at risk both on the supply, commodity, uh, pricing, as well as on the fulfillment side will be very important. And lastly, um, I think some surgical interventions of technology will be, will be key, uh, especially as it relates to ensuring a continuity of work, driving monitoring, and last but not the least, uh, a lot of collaboration uh, between all the parties involved because I think all organizations are under tremendous stress. We are just looking at uh, 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 using collaboration as a big motivational lever as well uh, for organizations to come together, sail through, and then get to the next level of value. So I'll pause here. I mean, that's all, all I had uh, uh, today. Um, and um, I'd leave the floor open for questions. Sorry, I've breached my time. Apologies for that. Yeah, so thanks, Abhik. Uh, it was a wonderful session. Unfortunately, we are running out of time. So uh, any questions, if it is there, you may please post on chat. And uh, also you can send a mail also so that we can send it out to Abhik for response. Uh, with that, I would uh, invite uh, uh, Peter uh, to come in and uh, um, present uh, the capital project management and asset handover solutions uh, rendered by SAP and partner. So Peter uh, is a vice, senior vice president and he uh, is a practitioner in oil and gas in SAP. So Peter hails from Germany and he's there uh, presenting uh, for us. So Peter, welcome. Uh, Peter, you need to unmute yourself. Peter, you need to unmute yourself. Hello. Uh, Peter, you need to unmute yourself. Ah, yeah, here we go. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, can, can you hear me? Can you see my screen also? 
Yeah, it will be good if you put it on presentation view. Yes, sure. Yeah. Yes. Um, hello, everyone, and um, yes, as my 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 speakers before have been saying, I, I consider the privilege to to present to you to the Indus community, and um, I'm uh, very much appreciate the presentations before because I think they set the scene uh, very very nicely to what I would like to to share with you which is about capital project management and asset handover. And what APIC has been uh, showing before, uh, I think it, it very, very nicely describes the challenges we are seeing uh, with our oil and gas customers. First of all, we, we're certainly in troublesome times at the moment. Um, it's difficult to earn money. And uh, one phrase I just took down from APIC, which I think uh, is another fundamental challenge our customers are facing, it's the data level, um, which um, which is simply not there um, for many of our customers. So they have SAP systems in place, but they are not maybe not fed or not integrated in the right way. So a lot of anal um, analysis, uh, which uh, which would support the business, uh, cannot be met and cannot be established. And what I would like to show you is um, how project management or capital project management is it can be set up. Uh, I will show a number of references here. Um, what we have, for instance, a, a nice portfolio management. These are things that in some cases may not be brand new, but what we are seeing, um, they're accelerating uh, in our customer base. So it, sometimes it takes a few years to adopt these things. Uh, really to get integrated data and then to derive the 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 anal anal analytics and insights uh, which epic has been referring to now let me start with the sap oil and gas value map um, so in a tight cooperation with uh, our customer community we're defining every few years or updating editing a value match which lays the basis for many discussions with our customers um, as you can see here, the yellow shaded, uh, yellow colored boxes, these are the main topics we're talking about. And then on the second uh, half of, of the picture on the bottom, you see those things which are more generic, uh, so th which also hold true for other industries. So what, what we want to achieve uh, working here in the industry, business unit oil and gas is certainly to carve out um, the specific industry specific things which differentiate uh, the processes and uh, where our customers put a very high value on. So first of all on the left side and I put a red box around it, it's part of a project orchestration. And we took down engineering, portfolio project management, then the topic of STO, the, the shutdown, turnaround and outages closely linked to maintenance and the project logistics. And on the right side are also uh, marked asset operations and maintenance. So on the operation, once everything's established, this is certainly a main part, what you see in the oil and gas side. Now the engineering part, is certainly something um, that, that's it's intensively discussed. We have the EPCs who are doing a lot of engineering work. Um, nevertheless, we do find that um, in large companies such as Shell or Reliance or elsewhere, you find, you find engineers who do the specifications, um, who work uh, very closely with the EPCs, um, who watch and, and, and judge their work, uh, and eventually do the, do the handover. Now, all of this, and that's the, certainly the ambition of an SAP system, has to be integrated. Um, so really starting from the description, the approval of the project, the budgeting, the documents, uh, the activities that they were going to be signed off, the payments eventually, um, and then the handover and the maintenance uh, of the assets and the equipments. That's all been easily said. Uh, it's, it's far more difficult to, to orchestrate this. Uh, around hundreds of, of uh, different EPCs around the world. Uh, they may have different standards or they may have different solutions in place. So really providing the interfaces or collaborative solutions where they can work on. And that's going to be the focus uh, of my presentation. So I would like to start uh, with the basic end-to-end -end process, uh, which certainly guides us. It is not our ambition to reinvent the wheel. So we're looking at a typical business process where we have a strategy upfront, right? So 
uh, we start maybe with an investment decision um, or set a strategic goal. And um, so from here on, um, we start to define and look at a certain projects. Now, project proposal may be uh, a business opportunity. Uh, it may equally be an, an STO project um, that has, has to be done. And along these things, assuming that we have a central um, project committee, it is certainly very, very important that we have a standard way of looking at it. So a risk assessment um, that we do eventually do a ranking. Is this a profitable project? Um, what, are, what else do we have to consider here? What is the budget? Um, so all these things have to be standard um, in a or formalize in a process that we eventually come over a stage gate into, into the real project management. So those projects that have been approved, um, that we are going to, to structure the project. Um, everybody knows, I think, work breakdown structure elements. I think that's a common thing um, where you are going to aggregate costs where you have budgets, um, where you have certain milestones. But on top of that, you could also equally have uh, activities, networks underneath. And I think the nice thing that now for more than two decades, uh, oil and gas companies are, are really intensively using is uh, the connections eventually, for instance, to, um, to procurement where you have POs. Um, if you are in a maintenance mode, you have also your maintenance orders that are linked to, to the networks and eventually then aggregated on a WBS element. Everything then, uh, milestones um, you have defined that may be achieved or where you may have overruns. Um, so uh, these are things. Then uh, procurement is certainly a vital topic. Um, the nice thing about having an integrated system uh, that once you uh, have procured or uh, have released a PO, certainly then going to be shown and visualized uh, in the project management budget. Also uh, the delivery times, so everything can be synchronized and getting back to the presentation before, these are the, the kind of data you would certainly like to have to say, um, are you in time, are you in schedule, uh, can you optimize certain things or um, do you, for instance, uh, run into, into time issues or uh, do you procure too many things or from the wrong vendor? This is all the data that's essential eventually for this analysis, right? The execution parts, the different phases of a project, um, the accounting, uh, what has been budgeted, uh, what are the actual costs, uh, what is going to be planned. Um, and again, uh, certainly the topic around the milestones. At the end of the day, we say monitoring uh, at each level. Um, may this be on the procurement side, may this be on the planning side, may this be for third parties. Everything there could be monitored. Uh, you have dedicated reports, uh, controls, um, you have project controllers who are working on this and certainly the point about plan versus action. Now this is not brand new, uh, I concede, but uh, we find that in many cases, uh, shortcuts may be taken or um, a number of different solutions are in place, which make it quite cumbersome to bring the different pieces together. Now the strategic portfolio planning and reporting uh, is something we had to take a deeper look. And if we have the strategic part, I'd like to point you uh, to something um, which we call the digital boardroom. So you have different options what you could be using. You can have the, the embedded uh, reporting that you find in a project system or that you find in portfolio project management. But something probably far nicer is if you have such a boardroom capability, a cloud-based analytics solution, which basically takes down uh, or takes the data, sucks it in the system, and then displaces in a very condensed manner. Uh, you could also add things such as a value driver tree, for instance, so certain impacts. You could simulate certain things. And you certainly have, I think that's most important, um, and that's the ambition of the digital boardroom, to have a view once a steering committee, a project committee, which must uh, get an overview of a number 
or dozens of different projects, gets a condensed view and speaks and has one common impression. So um, the reports you'll find here had been defined up front. Everybody who's, uh, who's looking at the report has the same impression and you can discuss it. I'm, um, I'm talking so because at SAP we ourselves uh, use this tool. So if we have management meetings, uh, this is uh, the core view uh, that's gonna be used. So everybody has the same information. And out of this, you can, um, you can drill down. You can certainly say what, what project uh, is not in shape, what project has run out of its objectives. And uh, so the different data points uh, that have been collected throughout the phase of the project can here displayed in many, many ways. So this is just an example, as you can see here, um, uh, example of a, of a type of navigation and you can manipulate or you can shape it in, in many different ways, uh, any way you're going to like it. So with alerting, uh, geo views um, that had been described before, for instance, um, you could zoom into uh, certain geographical areas, for instance, or as been said, you can, for instance, simulate the things. Now, if we look a little bit closer into um, into, into uh, the portfolio, project and portfolio management. That solution we brought to the market roughly 10 years ago and we continuously improved the thing and it has become, become a very popular uh, solution in the meantime. It is really a layer which we put on top of the typical project system. The project system with the WBS element is something just about every oil and gas company has in place. Now with the uh, project and portfolio management, we have an overarching layer. So here you can see, for instance, a project proposal. And we recently had a very interesting talk with a, with a large oil and gas company. Uh, it is not always clear how these decisions are made and taken. Uh, we have a lot of projects that are put into a funnel that have to be discussed. And just to provide, to provide the same information, so from documents to the right risk profile, uh, to the milestones, uh, to the right status, uh, to the right dates from start to finish. All of this that we are going to standardize these things and that we're really saying what project is likely to, uh, to be profitable, likely to work, whereas others are maybe likely to fail. So that you have a complete overview and that you have a dedicated stage where you decide are you going to proceed with the things or not. And I think the, the very interesting thing is at what, at what uh, point do you have interactions with the operational project systems that are lying underneath? So let's say for instance, the budget. Once something has been approved, you're going to allocate the budget to the project uh, that are underneath. On top of that, the nice thing certainly about such an integrated solution is that you are, can use the workflows, so all the HR um, configuration certainly uh, taken over. Um, documents are shared, uh, whatever you're going to use, may it be open text or may it be the SAP document management system. All of these things are tightly integrated and can be used. Now from here on, uh, you can, once assuming that uh, such a project has been approved, um, you can have a drill down to a granularity you like, you think it's sensible. And let's say for instance, on a, on a summarized level materials or services are going to be uh, estimated uh, through, through the years. Those uh, or, the, or those who, the, the costs that have already been uh, allocated are also displayed. And again, this is then tightly integrated to the underlying systems. And here you can say, for instance, the planning elements, um, you can drill down into, into more details and then do uh, here, as you can see the WBS element, this is a, a screenshot from the underlying project system. So this is all done automatically on a certified interface. Also things um, that are coming naturally with a project are the issues, right? Project issues that come up, changes uh, that are coming up. And then certainly uh, the thing is the versioning of a project, the revision of a project. What is going to happen with such a change? Is this change approved? Does it have a major impact? Who's going to sign these things off? Where are you going to collect it, right? Um, 
it even up to the payments of the EPC. So it has many, many impacts. So this is another project that has to be embedded in such a project management tool. Again, risk management, uh, something, another very, very important part that you have really a qualified risk profile that everybody agrees what is a risk, how is a risk measured, what are the characteristics of a risk, and what is the likeliness that a risk occurs on what you can, what can you do to mitigate such a risk. So this gives you an impression how you can work, first of all, with the, with the top layer, which I would call the digital boardroom, something where we really have a very condensed view for those who are working in the top management or in the, in the steering committee around many projects. Then underneath you have your portfolio and project management, um, which is more operational where you can approve budgets or approve stage gates, walk into the next phase, and still have a big overview. And then the operational project management where you collect all the costs, the documents, and the data. So this is basically the systematic we're working on. And here we have, um, I think, a very nice customer case. Some may have seen that who have attended uh, BPOC, um, the Best Practice Oil and Gas Conference, so Valero as the largest um, refiner in, in the US is a very welcome speaker here. And the background, Valero is a, a very, a very old uh, and a very, I would say, a very intense SAP user. And um, what they have done is for exactly the same reason as been telling, they did not have a, a very good overview of, of the projects that are occurring from a certain size on. Um, and they wanted to, to have a complete overview and a very structured and standardized process for, for the projects. And it's, we're not talking about investment projects um, in most of the cases, but for instance, engineering changes that are taking place or certain maintenance work that is occurring that have not been on the radar before. So what they are doing here is um, a few things. Um, the portfolio and project management they are implementing, uh, then the forecast and the budgeting that they want to do with SAP. And for instance, the AFE process, so approval for expenditure documents approval process, then being integrated in such a, um, in such a tool. They also want to look at capacities, resource management, as shown in the presentation before, also with uh, third party workers. And then the integration open text, uh, so the document management, uh, the upload, download, the change of documents, the versioning of documents, the signing of documents to certain objects uh, in the project management system. All that is very, very important. And again, I cannot emphasize more enough, um, the value drivers for Valeo had been cre create a standard model for the engineering work request, right? That everybody follows from a certain size on the same procedure, the same stage gates. No redundant systems or minimize redundant systems and eventually certainly most important for the operational workers, simplify the work. The benefits certainly it has to save costs at the end of the day, make, make project management far leaner. Um, here if, and I, I screenshotted here Valero's PPM presentation from the BPOC. Um, Peter, sorry, these... uh, time check, please. I mean, you have five minutes. Okay, five minutes. Okay, good. Then I will walk a little bit, a little bit quicker through these things. Um, so here you can see, um, as been said, um, different systems that have been using engineering work requests that are now going to be consolidated into one system. So here, for instance, the changes uh, that are uh, work orders that are going to be integrated, um, and open text ECM engine. Um, the, uh, the integration to the open text content server. All of this has been realized um, in the Valero project. Another one is the SASREF. SASREF is a joint venture uh, of Saudi Aramco and Shell. And I'd like to emphasize here all the value drivers really to create a link between the plant maintenance shutdown orders and the project system structures and also do the scheduling. Here you can see, this is a SASREF process diagram where you have really the portfolio and project management on the top, where you have the project system underneath, and then you have the possibility to, to multi-resource scheduling cockpit, for instance, have the planning here and really have the detailed activities that are going to be scheduled. And the nice thing really, it is tightly integrated. So once you do a rescheduling, 
uh, then the timelines are going to be updated on the portfolio and project management. Last but not least here, BASF, which is uh, more or less our neighbor here in the headquarter from SAP. Similar thing, they wanted to have a global cross uh, project reporting, monitor the strategic KPIs um, and standardize the engineering work. So the benefits now is similar to what you see with Valero, a central project repository, a harmonized system. Okay. Now the handover, let me in the last few minutes show a little bit of the handover. What is one of the very, very crucial bits is how are we working with the EPCs? And um, I've been myself working in an industrial gases company that had been built creogen plants, uh, such as liquefaction. And it is, had always been a challenge. How do you do the handover? Typically do paper-based and you have huge amounts of, of files uh, you're handing over. Now, it's a certainly the time to be to do this a little bit smarter and upfront. This certainly implies, and um, what APIC has been uh, stating before, it's also about do you have the same standards, the same classification schemes, and do you have some sort of a collaboration tool that can be doing that? So what what SAP is has been introducing to the market a few years ago is to say next to project management discipline. We need a collaboration space where documents uh, are handed over, where you have a to-do list, task lists, alerts that are going to be shared in a very easy way um, around the third party, uh, third party people. Because if you look and here for instance at timelines, how projects, investment projects, they may take two to four years and the handover really coming into operation and using the plan to 100%, in many cases, it just simply takes too long. So the handover to the maintenance organization, the training, um, uh, changing or taking over the classifications application schemes, the replacements, for instance, um, of, of some of the, the parts, uh, the activities, the assignments of the cost that eventually has to, uh, has to come into place, that oftentimes it just simply takes too long. So the discipline, we, we talk, call it the intelligent asset management, as you can see here, this really implies that we open up our tools in a very intelligent way uh, to our third party workers and make it possible to take a look upfront into what we are planning, share the documents, visualize a lot of things and collaborate with them. And here you can, I'd like to show, um, just to give you a little bit of an impression, our project intelligence network, this is the product we introduced three years to the market, is going to look like. So it's a very simplistic tool in terms of the user interface that everybody can use it. And here, for instance, we have, um, I can let me just stop it here. As you can see here, this is the collaboration space for a certain plant. We have here a hospital, excuse for that, but um, it's just something where we want to collaborate on. So from the location, you can see scheduled, you can see the certain tasks, uh, things that are overdue, also a financial view. Um, things that, and by the way, the, certainly the PIN is integrated in the backend systems. And we are going to open up this for, uh, for, another, um, for, them, for another EPC. So if we invite someone, um, and again here, all of the security issues are certainly taken into consideration. Um, these, as a, as a supply and vendor, these um, companies are embedded in the SAP system so that we do not have um, uh, business partners flying around that are not part of, part of the core system. And for instance, in that case, simple architect, we are going to invite um, to, for this project and um, we are going to send automatically a mail to him. And from that on, integrated into the backend SAP system, uh, this person or this company is part of um, the project intelligence network, can share documents and so on. You have seen that, right? Good. Okay. Okay. Um, 
So here, um, just to sum it up, because I think we are just in time, this is a landscape um, where we um, have the Project Intelligence Network has been shown as uh, part of the intelligent assets, um, and asset management and then integrated into uh, the solutions I've been shown before, uh, the project management, the finance, the PLM, the handover that's taking place. And you can optionally certainly use like S3 for instance for geolocations and SAP Ariba system to really to connect and exchange POs uh, to your vendor and supplier or something like an open tech system. And what has been said before, once your data is, uh, is in a good shape and you have a complete data set, certainly things like machine learning or optimization analytics or artificial intelligence. Um, so for instance, optimizing um, the procurement, optimizing the delivery, all these things are possible. So that's hopefully gives you an overview how we are continuously improving project management and the asset handover, the collaboration with the EPCs. Thanks for that. I'd like to, to hand over back to you, Sandeep. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Peter. It was very meaningful. And most of the points probably which Avik was trying to highlight, you also tried within the short span. You covered it very nicely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if there's any questions, uh, gentlemen, you can please put on chat with now. With that, now I will invite uh, uh, colleagues from uh, Indian Oil, and uh, they will be speaking on. We sp we spoke a lot of the change management, and for the digital projects for which Indian Oil is doing a lot of digital projects, how they are able to manage the change through SAP uh, tools, how they are able to do a fast uh, testing, and how they are able to quick do a turnaround of those uh, digital projects. So let's hear from uh, Rajan Wahal and Manish. So Rajan and Manish, uh, you can start the presentation. Uh, good do... afternoon, Sandeep. I will share my screen. Yeah, yeah, please. You are able to see my screen? Yeah, we are, we are able to see you. See your screen and as well as hear you properly. Just put it on presentation mode, if you. Oh, uh, I'm trying to do that. Yeah. It's okay. Only thing, only, only, only my worry is that you will have to rush a little bit. Ah, it's okay. Um, I will um, just explain uh, this uh, four projects we have done last year after we have shipped it to um, HANA in uh, 2000, January 2019. Uh, then we picked up this four project, LAMA, Active Active, TDMS and CHARM. The reason for picking up this because our SAP um, infrastructure has become quite complex and we need some tools to handle the administration. And second thing, uh, once when we went for HANA, we have uh, created a DR site, which is 100% of the uh, data uh, main site. And uh, the hardware is uh, exactly same what we have put in data centers. And such a costly hardware, we don't want to uh, keep it ideal only for DR activity. So we have chose uh, to go active active where we can provide some read operations from the uh, DR site. Then another thing is because our SAP um, now is quite mature, uh, functional teams and all the teams are rolling out projects very fast in and around SAP. And they need this um, uh, mock system, test systems, uh, and many parallel projects uh, keeps on going uh, side by side simultaneously. So we have gone for same thing for TDMS. Charm was lo long pending from uh, at our end. And uh, after HANA, we are implement, We are able to implement that also. And uh, the first two, LAMA and Active Act is purely a technical uh, project, but TDMS and CHARMS are project where you will get a lot of uh, appreciation from function department because it you know, fulfills their needs. So what I'll do, I will uh, hand over to um, uh, Manish to explain you the uh, each item in detail separately. A very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, the, the motive for showcasing these four projects was that because uh, we feel that these four initiatives has uh, given us... Uh, uh, money. sorry, you need to be a little bit louder, please. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, right now, audible? Yeah, yeah, perfect. Yeah. 
Uh, what I was saying is that the motive for uh, showcasing these four initiatives was uh, with the intention that uh, all these four initiatives are uh, maybe you can call it these are very small initiatives uh, considering uh, the sort of projects that we handle. But these uh, four initiatives has given us a lot of value. It has uh, give, um, uh, so simply put, it has uh, made our life very simple in data center uh, operations and second uh, uh, these all these uh, four uh, uh, functionalities have given us a lot uh, as far as the investment was concerned so first part is uh, i will start with uh, landscape management uh, landscape management is a uh, uh, is a basically a software life cycle uh, uh, tool being provided by sap for to handle the abap and java stacks so what uh, right now is happening with us in uh, as far as our setup is con is concerned uh, uh, we have got a lot of sy systems yeah, in earlier days the uh, the number of systems were quite less but over the period of time the systems have increased the land and the landscapes are uh, because they have become very huge and it was becoming a, a huge task to manage all these things so in fact we were thinking of to go for some third party product or Maybe we were in touch with IBM Accenture also to what what can be done to basically uh, optimize uh, the data center activities. So uh, as far as we are concerned, this uh, what this tool which SAP is providing right now, uh, that is landscape management, it has basically made our life quite easy, and um, and most of the administrative processes that we do from basis side are basically being addressed by this tool only. Um, uh, basically to start with, um, uh, you, uh, in this you can automate all the administrative processes and uh, whatever uh, activities you do on the data center part, that, uh, on the database part, that also you can undertake. And, and, and most of the, and, uh, last but not last, it, it, it gives you a centralized view of the complete landscape. So, so these were the challenges and this is why we chose SAP Llama and um, most on um, most all, all the three, uh, whatever pain points were there, as far as we were concerned, is, has been addressed by SAP Llama. And uh, through this, we are able to do all the mass operations, capacity planning, shutdown of the instances across the data center within the data center, across the data center, across the applications, all this stuff can be done through this tool. And um, apart from that, uh, uh, number of projects are going on, upgrade projects and number of functional projects are also going on. There the requirement is of having a basically uh, mock systems, uh, clone systems. So all these things we are doing it through SAP Llama and uh, and it gives you a centralized view also of how many databases you are running, what are the status of those databases. So um, I think uh, uh, the motive for uh, showcasing this was uh, that, that, that this small tool has given us a lot of uh, value and it has basically made our life very quite easy. So just to drive to the point, uh, for uh, uh, as far as our ERP system was concerned, we used to take around 24 hours to uh, basically uh, do the system refresh. Now it has come down to four hours. So whatever post and uh, pre and post activities were, de were there with the um, uh, system copy that has basically been, uh, 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 that, that process itself we have basically uh, uh, configured in the that Llama tool. And uh, it all, it happens when, uh, in a sequential fashion. Some, some processes are parallel, some are sequential. So all those stuff is being managed by the llama and uh, we have seen that around 80 percent there is a reduction in the amount of effort that we used to do and uh, most of the manpower earlier were basically engaged in all these activities so right now we have moved out of that and uh, uh, it gives us also the question that we can basically position those people for some other value-added jobs <clears throat> So just to give, uh, drive the point, uh, these are the basically uh, the sort of activities, the sort of capability that the Llama tool is having. So uh, it can manage your complete SAP HANA landscape, S4 HANA also, 
uh, you can do a mass uh, startup shutdown and whatever activities you think you can do with all this uh, tenant movement tenant creation tenant uh, uh, by copying moving all across the databases that you can do you, uh, you you can go for post copy or automation also where you create a system copy and then uh, you have got a certain uh, you have got certain set of activities which needs to be performed before the activity or after the activity so that that can be configured one time and then again just you run that template and it does the job all these activities it provides you the dashboards also uh, you can have a consolidated view of all your uh, all your of all the systems within the data center and across your dr site hs site in fact you can do a switch over also through this uh, from uh, the active site to your um, uh, standby site and there are uh, they have given you provisions also where you can basically write down your own requirements uh, if you uh, say if, if it's a complex b2b system or maybe <clears throat> Some other system. They, they, then, then also you can basically uh, write your own requirements uh, to check something is running or not running. Then do this. If it is running, then then you do this. If it is not running, then you do that. So all those things are there with that. And uh, DB upgrades is also possible through this. And uh, uh, and most of the this whatever PCA jobs you do post copy automation also. So on top of that, if a new system is being created, then also uh, to basically to fence the system for uh, 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 basically there is a requirement that, uh, that 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 the system should not post any wrong transactions or no wrong transactions should be posted to the system. So what it does that this uh, tool basically freeze, uh, uh, fences the complete system, and uh, that that is uh, uh, basically I think a major requirement from functional side. So all these things are basically being handled by Llama tool. <clears throat> so the sort of setup that we are having is that our complete infrastructure is based on uh, um, HP hardware. On top of that, uh, that we are using SUSE uh, OS and the application, uh, again, uh, various other applications are there, ECC, BPC, Gateway. So this complete ab ABAP stack and this Java stack, we are managing it through this. And uh, we, uh, that. Uh, the implementation uh, we got it done through SAP DBS service only. So, and uh, the implementation took around eight weeks, and uh, quite uh, good number of people. Uh, I think uh, the person from the product development side from SAP also uh, uh, basically worked with us in configuring the system. And uh, uh, I can say that yes, uh, whatever we had. Uh, basically anticipated in the initial stages, many of the things we have been able to achieve. Future plan, yes, we basically, as far as Lama is concerned, we would like to go for near zero runtime maintenance and uh, uh, DC operations, yes, uh, in fact, we are in uh, working together with SAP and HP to basically integrate this Lama tool with our storage systems. So <clears throat> going forward, we, um, um, we basically plan to have these two functionalities um, uh, to go live on these two uh, functionalities. So this is the uh, dashboard that you get um, uh, uh, through the Llama, Llama tool, and this gives you a consolidated view of your uh, uh, data center, complete SAP landscape. So as, as, as I told you earlier that also through this screen, you can do a switch over also to from the primary to the secondary site and switch back to again to the sites. You can do tenant movement, tenant copy. So all those operations are now basically template based and it gives, it, it leaves little room for any human error. So that is the major point uh, because when you've got a running setup, so the chances of doing manual error, yeah, that is, um, that we wanted to avoid. So this is something uh, that that's why we are uh, quite happy with the implementation of this. So this is the benefits that we have got. So centralized landscape management is there, maintenance, near zero runtime maintenance. This we are looking at, this we have not done. We plan to do in the next stage, phase two. And uh, ABAP PCA functionality, as I told that um, uh, this is a post copy, whatever, uh, there, there might be some unique requirement for any, for every stage, for each system, every system. So all those unique requirements can be addressed through this PCA functionality. And this um, uh, 
Lama has got uh, integration with uh, Active Active Read also. So um, uh, this this is a new feature that they have brought in. So the moment we touch upon that uh, Active Active Read functionality, so uh, the point is that it, it, it since it's an coming from the OEM side, it gives you complete visibility and and most of the functionalities are getting uh, day by day. It is all those functionalities they are bringing in into this tool. <coughs> Second one was um, Active Active Read Enable. So uh, what, what you to happen is that uh, whatever uh, infrastructure that we were having in, in, in earlier we used to have uh, uh, um, when it was there so most of the standby systems were lying in an idle position so 100% hardware uh, we used to provision at the standby site at the cluster site and uh, uh, the pain point was that we were not uh, we were unable to use it productively so this is something which uh, they have brought in with the HANA database so what, 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 what the meaning is that um, uh, your uh, standby systems also, you can basically access it for read operations. So this uh, functionality also we have enabled. And <clears throat> right now we have grown around uh, more than 10,000 concurrent users run, uh, basically accessing our system. So there was a requirement from the business also that uh, you move all the, um, uh, your, uh, read operations to the standby side. So this is uh, through Active Active, <coughs> we have implemented that. And uh, what it happens that uh, any, the, uh, this basically, this Active Active gives you both implicit and explicit connections. And uh, <coughs> it, uh, um, and uh, I think it is from EHP8, this is, uh, this is being, uh, this Active Active read enabled is being supported on ECC SOH. And as for Anna, it is uh, natively supported. So um, um, whatever, uh, if there is any SQL which is going to the, which is hitting the primary, so if there is any read operation involved, so that that read operation can be diverted to the secondary site and uh, um, all the sorting and uh, that uh, select uh, from SQL side can be done on the secondary database. So it basically frees your primary database for the actual OLTP transactions and all <laughs> reporting sort of things can be moved to secondary site without the user coming to know of all these things. It requires a tweaking uh, from on the website if it's a um, YZ or a customized uh, development. And uh, as far as <clears throat> as for Hana is concerned, it is natively supported. So the um, that is also uh, so that 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 gives you basically a, a better ROI and um, the earlier the uh, standby site used to uh, be idle most of the most of the time and only during dr drill or uh, switch over we used to access that uh, secondary site otherwise the hardware was of no use so with this uh, functionality that uh, we are able to utilize our uh, this uh, secondary hardware in a much better fashion Third is <coughs> the TDMS, that um, this um, test data migration server. So uh, uh, customers who are having uh, uh, bigger size ERP systems, they will actually feel the pain. So uh, with numerous uh, SAP projects running uh, parallel, there was a, always there used to be a crunch on our side and uh, on the basis side that you have to basically provide different uh, mock-up mock systems to all these uh, different different project groups so with the tdms uh, we have been able to basically slice the data of the production data and uh, create a subset of the production data and uh, and deploy it on a secondary system and then that can be that system can be basically offered can can be offered to different functional groups to carry on with their projects so it gives a mirrored uh, uh, data of the production system. And uh, so whatever infra expenditure that we were having in creating uh, large volume uh, 
databases so that that we have been able to reduce that our database size around around 11 10 to 11 tb on soh so uh, every for every project or every initiative it was not possible to basically provision to provide 11 tb boxes to each and every fun uh, functional group so uh, with this uh, tool we have uh, basically this tdms tool was long time back so but but uh, since we have reached this stage so i we thought that it, yes let us go for it because uh, this uh, as this was providing data slicing uh, functionality so we thought yes let us go for it and uh, the, by, when we have implemented we are seeing the benefits and um, I think within one year it has given us the complete uh, whatever investment that we have made. So complete uh, returns we have got on this. <clears throat> so um, uh, basically one or two financial years we take for slicing the data and uh, the, 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 we have seen around 70 to 80% reduction in that production data size. Uh, production data size. <clears throat> and, the, and the data remains the same and it is the fresh data that, that we get. So. Uh, that is there. So, uh, so this is how the process is like. So, uh, in uh, TDMS uh, uh, Central, uh, in our case, we have made Solution Manager as a, a TDMS control system, and uh, from the production, as a keeping it as a source, we create a, uh, a TDMS system. So, basically, the slicing can be done on two aspects. One is time slicing, another one is object slicing. So, <clears throat> time slicing, you can define the uh, time period uh, up till which time you want the data. So, uh, we, uh, you can have that data set accordingly. Object wise, uh, you can have based on objects, you can have, say, suppose somebody wants that you want to have a sales data or say HCM data. So, you can have basically this is the data time slicing is a horizontal slicing, and object slicing is a vertical slicing. So you could, um, the intention is that you can create different subsets of data, and and uh, this TDMS has got uh, integration with uh, Fury apps also. So you can basically see the uh, progress and how much data has been transferred or not. Those things you can do. So the process involved in in this is basically you create a shell, which which is basically the repository from the production system, production system. You create, uh, you copy the shell. After the shell is created, then you go for that client independent data and then client dependent data, transaction data is, get, is ultimately pushed to the system. So this is how it has been arranged. And uh, <clears throat> just to show you that initially before TDMS, we, our mock system used to be of 11 TB. Now, right now it is 3 TB with, two, uh, with uh, uh, two financial years. So if, if I reduce it to one financial year, the size will come to around 1.5 or 2 TB. So uh, you can very well anticipate the sort of uh, leverage that it has provided to us. Uh, in the same box, I can have five, uh, yeah, around uh, four systems. And if I reduce the uh, time window, then uh, around five to six systems I'm able to create. And, and basically, we are able to concurrently run five to six projects at a time. And this is what is happening right now at our location also. We are right now, we are in the midst of running four or five very uh, high visibility projects. So, uh, because of this uh, tool that uh, within the existing infra, we have been able to exploit that. So, uh, this uh, another this tool we thought that yes, it is better to showcase to the different users. <coughs> so, this is the uh, process. Manish, uh, sorry, uh, uh, just five minutes, and you have two questions also. You have to respond to two questions which are okay. on the chat. So these are the two, uh, this is a brief overview of the process that is there. So you can do a shell creation and data data scrambling. I forgot the, the data scrambling part is that suppose you have got an HCM data, you want to get a test system out of that. So you can scramble the confidential data. You don't want that people running on that or maybe business data also, if you want to scramble it, that you can do it. So uh, because since it's a subset of the production data, the, 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 there, is some, uh, there is some requirement from the business also that now you basically scramble the data. So it cannot be used in a some in advertisement uh, fashion. And the fourth one is this charm. This is a long tool, which was, uh, this is, uh, which was uh, provided by SAP, but we, we 
uh, never use that. So, but uh, after implementation, uh, the response from our business has been uh, uh, excellent. So, uh, the, uh, this uh, whatever projects and whatever actually just to give you the backdrop around, uh, on a per day fashion, we move around 40 to 50 transports from development to the production system. So this happens on per day fashion. So all those things have been basically streamlined and this used to be a manual operation. So uh, everywhere the basis used to be involved, basis guys. So uh, with the implementation of this, uh, it is uh, basically this has been subdelegated to the functional groups. And uh, within that we have created that approver and requester uh, levels and uh, whatever changes are there in the system that basically they <coughs> that requirement is getting captured and basically that uh, transports also happen and you basically maintain the logs also, audit log also. So this tool also we thought that if somebody is having a somewhat uh, extensive uh, SAP development environment, so better to work with a charm. Uh, so this is uh, from our side. So if there are any queries, so yeah, there are two questions. Uh, one is from Mr. Devananda Bera. Uh, he's asking that can Lama manage uh, ECC landscapes or it can manage only HANA landscapes? Uh, that we have to check because since we are on SOH, so. Okay, Mr. Devananda will probably check up uh, with also and will come back on that. Manish uh, will then have a separate discussion. Yeah. And Mr. Rajiv Arora is asking Manish, have you ever tried slicing the payroll data also using TDMS? Yeah, we are doing it uh, in right now. This is the we uh, up till now we had done data slicing on based on the time uh, factor only, but right now we are doing this uh, same thing. Uh, and basically, the process is underway. Great, great, great. And then we have done it in the initial stages, so that there the response was satisfactory. So this time we are going to deploy it in a productive fashion. We are going to give it for a, a project as such. It's HCM project, uh, guys, they are asking for that. Yeah. So thanks a lot. I mean, four projects, such a short time you had to <laughs> deliver, but you know, you have- any All, all credit goes to the SAP Max Attention. <laughs> uh, okay. And our thanks. team. Yeah, great, great, great. I think these are these these single slides. We got very good help from you guys. So uh, yes, these four projects were critical projects also, and these were basically touching our existing SAP landscape also. So yes, I think uh, this we have managed it quite well. Thanks a lot, uh, Manish and Rajan. And if there are questions, I would uh, request everyone to post on the chat, and we will share it with uh, Manish. And Rajan uh, okay. to Thanks, respond Andy. separately. Yeah. Thanks a lot. So with that, I request uh, Nikhil, uh, Nikhil Chaturvedi, who is our Vice President, IB, IBU Oil and Gas, to invite uh, four panelists, and uh, and then we will have a panel discussion. So Nikhil, you can please invite. And, uh, yeah, Rajan, if you can just uh, unshare your presentation, we, uh, we don't require a presentation this time. Unshare, <laughs> Yeah. I'll close this. Okay. Yeah, you just close it. It will be done. Yeah. Thanks. So, Nikhil, you can please uh, invite your co-panelists. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being patient listeners so far. And we had some very good presentations. Special thanks to the Indian Oil team uh, because they shared a, a very good technical example of how technology is being used not just specific to uh, capital projects, but still project management of uh, technology in nature. So now let me welcome our uh, four panelists here. So first of all, we are running a bit late. So we'll try to finish it within uh, uh, 30 minutes instead of 40 minutes. And uh, with the uh, approval of uh, Mr. Manoj Kumar and Mr. Vikas Prabhu, we may like to uh, take the next presentation on uh, WhatsApp, uh, maybe in the next uh, quarterly workshop, if we uh, don't get enough time. So, so first of all, let me welcome uh, Mr. Atul Paranjpe. You can see him on the screen. He is the uh, CDO for, from uh, LNT uh, Hydrocarbons. And then we have uh, Mr. Ravi Prakash, who is the head of IT uh, at ONGC. You can see him on the screen. 
And uh, we also have uh, Mr. Uh, Sumit Dutta Gupta. He's the CIO of Haldia Petrochemicals. Uh, uh, you know, um, Mr. Dutta Gupta, welcome once again. Uh, I remember you had also participated in our panel discussion uh, for chemicals industry during uh, our May workshop. So uh, thank you once again. And last but not the least, you have already listened to Abhik uh, Chatterjee, uh, partner and MD from uh, BCG. He's uh, also online. So let's uh, start the discussion. So as you know, today's theme is uh, around capital project management and asset handover from EPC companies to the owner operator companies, which could be oil and gas companies or petrochemical companies, etc. Uh, first of all, we are clearly in, a, in very uh, turbulent times right now, not just because of COVID, but also because of the situation of oil and gas industry. But these times will not remain forever. And our objective here in, uh, in this oil and gas uh, events is to talk about topics which are of long term interest and capital project management will always be a very significant activity for uh, oil and gas and petrochemical companies. So uh, considering this uh, current situation where we see every day hear and read about uh, oil and gas companies shelving their projects. I've, uh, I'm based in Japan and I read a lot about Chinese and Japanese companies. And if you look at CNPC and CNOC, the Chinese national oil companies and the uh, and oil super majors like Shell, Exxon Mobil, all of them, because of the current situation, they are postponing their projects and big capital investments are being postponed. So uh, with that backdrop, let me start uh, my first question to Mr. Atul Paranjpe. And I would like to ask, uh, sir, during the last three to five years, from an EPC company's perspective, what kind of uh, changes uh, have you seen in terms of digitalization uh, in the oil and gas uh, industry related projects? And, uh, you know, uh, for example, do the, the oil companies ask you for a lot of documents in a digital format? Uh, I remember when I used to work for Indian Oil, we had all, uh, uh, you know, PNIDs, PFDs, etc., in large uh, paper format, chart format. So, how has the situation changed? Please share that information with us. Yeah, first of all, uh, in the last four to five years, uh, there has been a lot of change in technology as well, uh, the digital technology. Though I would say oil and gas industry, uh, so to say, has been slightly laggard in this. Like uh, even uh, in, during the BCG talk, he said that infrastructure companies have adopted uh, much uh, higher uh, amount of digitalization than the oil and gas companies. But oil and gas companies are following up uh, close behind. Uh, and uh, like uh, he said that actually what infrastructure companies have done to begin with is connected machines, connected workers, Okay, and uh, that type of, uh, uh, you have logistics management, uh, uh, you sensorize the uh, trucks or the trailers or the logistics things and uh, do that. So those type of things uh, have been done a lot. Even the, uh, what you call the lidar based uh, measurements of uh, uh, materials or surveys, aerial surveys, all these type of things have been done a lot by the infrastructure companies. Uh, I think oil and gas also has followed closely on that and they also have implemented many of these uh, solutions. But to the specific question what you are asking about the documentation or the format in which uh, people are asking for the documentation, I would say nobody asks for paper nowadays, that is for sure. But uh, okay, uh, maybe five years back people started asking for CDs instead of uh, uh, paper. Uh, maybe a few years back, they started asking to upload the documents to their server or to their uh, sites. Okay. Uh, but still, I don't think people have really uh, started asking for a digital twin. Or you give me a 3D model with full linkages and all the documents and all the uh, operation and maintenance manuals and the test certificates and everything linked to the 3D model. You give that. That uh, I don't think people have started asking that, at least in the oil and gas sector. So that's what uh, would be my answer. Uh, I, I hope I have answered the thing. 
Yes, uh, and is that uh, perception based on, on uh, your Indian oil and gas companies' experience or uh, in other countries as well? No, no, even international companies also. Even in fact, uh, uh, we recently completed a big project for uh, Saudi Aramco, where we were supposed to upload all the documents onto their server, and they wanted us to upload all the scanned PDF test certificates. So we said that we will upload the thesis what we have received in soft form. No, 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 no. They said we want scanned with the signatures. So now actually it doesn't actually, it defeats the purpose of uploading yeah. a scanned document to the uh, thing. Uh, so so that, but, uh, but that's how it is. So still we are in that mode. Then suddenly after one year, they told us, no, no, you OCR the scanned documents and give us so that we can search inside the documents. Now th that is what they realized afterwards when we said that we'll give you a soft a digital copy and we'll also upload the scan document separately searches you do in this and you do that so realization to that uh, it takes time to come so international uh, uh, oil and gas players also are very much in the same boat i would not say in fact i think uh, indian oil and gas companies are uh, because of uh, the digital drive uh, most of the digital drive is led by maybe indians uh, they are very much aware of what is happening in the world Okay. In fact, recently, ONGC has been doing 30% and 60% review over uh, Microsoft Teams, okay, with us, with, with wow. LN team, uh, which, Excellent. of course, it was more pushed by COVID, but uh, <laughs> but COVID has also act as a, acted as a enabler, I would say. Okay, so uh, thanks a lot, Mr. Paranjpe. So now that you mentioned about uh, ONGC, so I'll uh, pose my next question to Mr. Ravi Prakash. Sir, can you please tell us, are the EPC companies and uh, IT companies, are they uh, adequately supporting you in your digital uh, digitalization initiatives? Are they bringing digital technologies as much as you want them to? Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I hope my voice is clear. That's very clear, sir. Please yes. go. Uh, so we started our digital journey way back. It's not that we started very recent. As a matter of fact, uh, we started the collaborative environment, I'll prefer to say, wherein it was feasible by all the stakeholders, whether uh, typically for our big capital projects, we have got three sets of teams. One is the team responsible for execution. Other is the team responsible for monitoring. Third one I'll prefer to say is the team responsible for designing sort of thing. So we had a provision where the collaboration between all these stakeholders happens online. But what Atul said, I 100% agree. It didn't, uh, it's not that 100% it happened through it. And in the beginning, because we started eight years back at that time, the requirement of IT, the way we interpreted or the way it was interpreted was, unless it is digitally signed, something signed also has to be there. Either it is digitally signed or something signed also has to be there for the record keeping. But down the line, yes, the things change. Nowadays, the requirement is not as strict. And our collaboration folder is still very much active. And the response of, uh, uh, I'll say the um, business partners is quite encouraging, particularly, of course, in COVID, it is very, very fantastic. But even before that, it has picked up a lot. And uh, most of the things were happening through systems. And like Atul said, paper-based things, very, very rare. I think uh, it's exception, I prefer to say it. The only thing is what we are aiming is, I think soon we'll be having that thing. And as uh, thanks to the ABIC or the BCG, they've given us basically not only the digital strategy, as a matter of fact, they've given us a long-term strategy, which is having digital strategy also as a key in it. So we are moving on that path. And uh, as a matter of fact, we are about to go to the S4, the contract is already finalized. There, the key requirement is this only. We don't want simply a technical upgrade from whatever database we are having to HANA and then that sort of thing. We want a sea change in the basic processes so that our processes are broadly location agnostic, person agnostic, and the department agnostic. All right. 
it depending upon the rules it is broadly based on the rules so the c change we are expecting it but as if i come back to your original question because time is also short yes we are getting good cooperation for most of big service providers big business partners but still it's a challenge with uh, i'll say medium to some of the big ones okay thank you thank you very much uh, person agnostic and department agnostic that's uh, yeah very well uh, said uh, i'll carry the same question to mr sumit datta gupta sir uh, can you please share your experiences in terms of digitalization in projects and how epc companies and it companies have supported you what more needs to be done yeah good afternoon again good afternoon all uh, i think uh, i agree with mr brand the professor ravi also see i think the support is very much there you know so today uh, if you see the strategy is definitely to go digital less of paper you know smart pn ids we are even even you know for our projects which will be shortly starting in chennai for our narajana refinery so where we are introducing the day one you know the, the smart log books uh, which is e log books e permits handle devices was inspection rounds and then uh, you know we are from the day one our project team is thinking of you know putting some analytics into the whole uh, initial uh, work place you know they have the project data the inspection data to improve the project and the quality of you know, the projects and they would also like to have the data you know produce the tag and track technologies so that they can tag those materials the resources and uh, so the transportability from directly from the oem space to here and wherever in the warehouse and storage locations they should be able to track it. and another important part is uh, you know safety part where we are also investing during this project on tagging the resources and the people so that we are going to go for geofencing and to ensure that we have less of those incidents happening and the safety and reliability in the site is uh, maintained to the highest level so these are some of the things performance monitoring predictive site scheduling and uh, workforce management which can optimize the project schedules and delivery so that's what we are working towards all right thank you very much now before i move on to abhik i would like to request uh, the audience if you have any questions please put them in the chat towards the end we'll like to take a few questions for the panelists so uh, abhik uh, uh, you mentioned in your presentation that you know there are uh, there's almost 175% uh, cost overrun and more than 60% of the projects were uh, delayed in terms of time uh do you think digitalization can help uh in uh, solving that problem and uh, and if yes to what extent i mean is digitalization really worth it in capital project money so three points uh, number one is uh, see like procurement capital projects is a is a really hot button target for saving and monitoring because you just get a lot of money that comes together at one go right whether it is executed processed measured etc so uh, while the world talks about asset maintenance but the ease with which you can impact pnl is very high on procurement and on capex okay so that's number one so money is there uh, the complexity though on the capex side is there is a real complexity on the upstream part and when i say upstream it's the it's the decision part of capex wherein you are really processing multiple rows line items of inside drivers commercial all pre feed type of work uh, and then there is a lot of handshake at the execution level that goes down later so obviously digitalization there is a uh, is a big lever uh a at the upstream part because that's a big place where in complex analytics can really play its magic the struggle though where companies face with it is not with the uh, uh it is not with the human being able to process the logic or the computation it's just about the inability of larger organizations to just pull together all that data into a certain structure or a format that can uh that can that can essentially process 
and secondly so which is which is almost like tell me the value and then there is a second part of retain the value which is in the capital project execution wherein there is third party lot of contractors epcs etc that are there wherein the handshake is there i think the entire magic of digital to impact tracking monitoring collaboration mr atul was mentioning about the journey with saudi aramco on and and that would really be even base level of digitization but as a as a trusted partner the collaboration today the world is getting into for example some of the larger uh, partners like stumbage baker hughes etc the the partnership and the technologies that they are using for collaboration are of a se separate nature so in summary um, digitization has a significant value but then it needs a lot of careful orchestration because this process has largely been a very niche novel and human driven process uh the moment a uh, 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 project managers are questioned that boss can we try and do analytics on that uh, it it gives them a sense that are you trying to audit my uh, 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 my capability of judgment and i think organizations are trying to replace this or sentiment with an and sentiment saying that guys in the future you just will be able to do x more things more and and in a better way and from a downstream perspective it is really about value leakage and value protection which is what you have planned upstream and what you do downstream a uh, multitude of tools right from control towers to there are organizations who are also trying to evaluate blockchain and smart contracts to really see how the handshakes between third party fourth party etc can happen uh, in this space so a there is value b the journey to that value though needs a lot of careful calibration and in my way a new way of working and some bit of process and policy change because that's not the way we as organizations have designed and decided to drive the entire end to end process uh, thanks abhik so you expanded uh, our scope of discussion uh, and i'll take my next question to mr paranj pe Uh, our, our objective is not only to talk about digitization, which is making the paper documents and PFDs and PNIDs in in electronic format. Our objective is digitalization, which is much more beyond uh, plain digitization. So, uh, Mr. Paranjpe, we saw in some presentations there was a mention about digital twins. Uh, has this concept of digital twins picked up in India and? Uh, are the uh, oil and gas or petrochemical companies asking the leading epc companies like yours to prepare digital twins while they uh, the project is uh, under construction stage uh, mr paranjpe you are on could you please unmute yourself yeah sorry yeah. uh i don't see uh, much uh, uh, insistence or uh, requirement being specified by the uh, owner uh, owner operator companies like ongc or iocl or uh, uh, spcl or any of these uh, where they say that i want a digital twin i want the 3d model with everything linked okay so that ha has not happened in past one or two cases we had for ongc given a aviva uh, model with some intelligence built in but uh, uh, that was not a full fledged digital twin you cannot call it a digital twin it was a maybe it was a more of a experiment on a digital twin that we have done in the past with ongc but uh, i don't think uh, people have insisted on a digital twin at least in the oil and gas sector uh, from us from epc companies who are actually executing the project uh, see my, here there is a problem uh, the feed or the basic design is done by somebody else in most of the cases detail engineering is done by the epc company and then the design or the 3d model or the data will be finally used for 30 years or plus years by the owners and operators so actually it has to start at the feed level and it should be integrated from there because if the, the digital twin has to be created in between by the engineering uh, detail engineering contractor Uh, his focus is more on execution and completing the project on time and handing over the plan so he might not really uh, uh, spell out or uh, carve out everything what is required by the owner or operator uh, for monitoring or maintaining or managing their uh, plan uh, for the future 
so this uh, exercise has to start even much before the detail engineering starts okay, what all is required in the digital twin specification of that that should start from the basic design so i don't think it is as of today uh, mature enough to do that maybe it is more mature in uh, maybe in uh, automotive industry where anyway everything is 3d based today a majority of our 3d is only for visualization it is not for manufacturing i don't use 3d for manufacturing i use it only for visualization while in automobile sector they use 3d for manufacturing so digital twin implementation becomes easier in a industrial machinery or a uh, automobile sector so i think that is what uh, there is some time for it to really catch up in the oil and gas industry right and we also realize that it's uh, uh, still possible for greenfield projects for brownfield projects it's even more difficult to implement digital twins i met with a company from the from the us who specialize in building digital twins it's a tedious job it requires a lot of uh, people to build up exact digital twin for the plant which is being proposed correct but for upgrades and uh, upgrades maybe if you are upgrading a small portion of the plant or replacing something there people do uh, do uh, what you call uh, scanning the plant and converting mm -hmm. that into a 3d model and then making a digital twin they do that but then it is a very small limited scope not for the whole plant even okay, for brown field i am saying yeah okay okay thanks a lot so i'll carry forward the question to mr uh, ravi prakash sir uh, could you please share with us what benefits have ongc harnessed out of this digitalization in capital projects and what's the future what more will be done in next 3 to 5 years <clears throat> so the if i take the journey since beginning then i'll come back to immediate developments the key problem with epc contracts in general and let's take a contract was when it was document based things first of all lot of time used to be spent in validating and evaluating those documents step number 1 step number 2 uses of those information was practically very limited it was more a milestone sort of thing than having a real contribution towards the decision so the direct uh, advantage if you ask me of digitization to capital products particularly is better transparency involved decision making and i'll say subletting some of the things to the system which was quite time consuming and there were chances of manual errors so for example now most of our projects if it follows that uh, of mac or the way we collaborative approach of the projects are there it is based on workflows and all these things depending upon business rules automatically the workflows are triggered they get the notifications all these things have been automated so first of all saving in time transparency record keeping because as uh, atul said it's very correct uh, broadly i can divide my project into three parts and each of them is very important one is design which we have covered second is the execution which we normally when we talk of capital project we talk about third is subsequent operation and the maintenance and then all these documents whatever you generate majority of it is of extreme use so now once it is digital moving it from that project stage to operational stage in our our maintenance schedules or operational things has become very very easy is the one word second thing is it's available i'll i'll admit the state we are in it is not being used as much but at least the complete documentation is there and the fourth major advantage we are getting is particularly during this covid and low price of crude stays management has to take a call which projects to pursue which to not and for that a lot many analytics were required i mean it was not a gut feeling decision it was possible to do in a gut feeling so they are having this digital dotas though of course we didn't had a direct link with the analytics there but the very fact that we are having uh, data 
in electronic form helped us a lot in analyzing those things, in evaluating those projects. So these are the key things we got from the uh, distagesons. Okay. All right. Th thanks a lot. Uh, and I'll uh, take forward the same question to Mr. Sumit Dutta Gupta. Uh, sir, could you please tell us uh, what has been achieved so far and what uh, more needs to be done or is planned to be done in the next few years? See, everybody is talking about digital twin, you know, in terms of uh, implementation, both in the operations and in the handover, takeover stage. I think these are something, as I think Atul rightly said, you know, in automating, but in oil and gas and the refinery and the petrochemical industry, there is a growing need. We are getting a lot of uh, failures from the technology providers like Aspen, G's of the world, they are just coming up and telling us to do some POCs and all. We are in presently doing it. So I think uh, more of digital, more of this digital twin to harness uh, the analytics process analytics along with the asset assurance models which can give a predictive part of the events coming up you can obviously reduce the you know, downtime and increase the throughput and the yield i think uh, the data analytics along with those uh, you know the uh, normal apcs and rt op has to combine together in a seamless way and that is what uh, i think can give the oil and gas industry, especially in the, in the sector of this chemical, petrochemical industry, to come out with, uh, you know, the better margins. And uh, another important part is, uh, you know, to improve the reliability, the asset uh, optimization also has become a very key uh, part. So those are the areas where I think people, as of now, are, you know, focusing on. And as we move ahead, uh, a lot of technology in this particular as aspect will be there and we should be able to do a lot of pilots to make it up and running and get benefit out of it. Thanks a lot, Sumitda. Thank you for those insights. And uh, last question of our uh, today's panel discussion is to uh, Abhik. Abhik, what's your final word of advice uh, to the Indian uh, oil and gas companies, owner operators and also EPC companies? Uh, on what should they do in terms of improving digitalization and uh, uh, especially considering what the global companies are doing? So, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now, especially considering you have international experience with both oil and gas and EPC companies. Can you hear me well now? Sorry. Yeah, 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 we can hear you. Sorry for that. Uh, I think we are at a, I mean, for us, it will be a, a, a we are at a very win-win situation as it comes to India. I think if you look at the best technology brains, most of them are Indians. Uh, if you look at the best startups in each of the space, they also happen to be in India, barring cybersecurity, which is largely in Israel and maybe some few other things. So whilst we struggle in one thing, I think it's the question for us in India is not around the what. I think I have a firm belief and uh, out of serving clients, not only in India, but also in the region uh, uh, is, uh, is most of us know what to do. I mean, the fact that we discussed uh, right from OCR to common data environment to, for example, uh, uh, digital twin. I mean, there is enough and more knowledge that we can do it. The question is how. So I think we majorly lack in how and on how on two parameters. In my experience, number one is, in fact, three points. Number one is most organizations have, but they could do with a better digital or a real technology strategy, which is what would you do to implement? And obviously that is linked on some hard facts, your current maturity, your appetite for investment. And I'm not asking anyone here to invest the moon. I mean, we stay in India. We have our own frugal ways of achieving the output. So I think there needs to be a real but a very effective technology slash digital strategy, whatever you call it, in interlinked with your systems of today, which is how can you drive data, how can you drive analytics, etc. The second part is 
in many places even our foundational systems are offline so we need to at least figure out that let's get pre and basics in place and then let's also drop some uh, really moon shots which are really high on value and in some cases we are piloting it the scale though is a separate challenge so in india the challenge is how can we scale from pilot because we just love uh, celebrating the pilot like we have won the icc world cup and most of the time we will demonstrate that but rarely has it happened that we have done it for 3 years it has lasted in 50 crores that has gone to the bottom line or top line so i think that is second and lastly is i think most organizations and i'm speaking to a very technology a literate and a technology leading team here in terms of panel as well as audience but we struggle with technology sourcing the time it takes us to stand up a data lake or a or a platform is almost same or many times more than the time it takes for you to run an analytics pilot on asset maintenance or capex it takes you can achieve a pilot in 4 months often the entire sourcing process is is 5 to 6 months or even longer and i think organizations globally the ones who have succeeded in scale have really not only put this strategy plus sourcing guideline plus the talent internally to support this journey and lastly i would say there needs to be a good amount of handshake from business to make this successful it after a point or digital after a point can only move certain parts of the body i think the entire body needs to move and organizations who have delivered again as i say value at scale wherein there is a wherein the cfo can sign off on the on the balance sheet saying that okay through digital i recognize xy crore i think there it's the organization is is has taken it people are using it and uh, learnings are generally on the way but it's a it's a reasonably literate digital literate organization so four points from my side and uh, sorry for this long wish answer to a short question problem thanks a lot abhik and uh, that brings uh, uh, an end to our panel discussion uh, i hope uh, we've been able to do it in time uh, so thanks a lot once again to abhik and mr ravi prakash mr paranjpe and mr sumit datta gupta for joining our panel discussion these are very rich insights and we'll love to have you again and again on our panel discussions in future so thank you very much thank you thank you so uh, thanks yeah, a lot sir yeah. yeah thanks a lot sir and it has been a really a very interesting discussion i'll beat the short time because these requires a little bit of more time we'll take care of it in future uh, uh now i uh, invite uh, colleagues uh, sai uh, and vinay uh, to come and demonstrate on uh, the business process capability of integration sap process integration uh, with uh, whatsapp and uh, more so we have selected this topic because this we understand that in the user community this is getting there is an increased attention and people have been doing in multiple various ways so uh, let's see what sap has been able to do with customers and how they are able to uh, do it uh, so uh, with that i welcome vinay and sai thanks uh, sandeep i hope my screen is visible i am sharing my uh, screen yeah your screen is visible and you are audible okay perfect so uh very good evening to all of you uh, this is vinay tripathi uh, very briefly uh, i think in next 15 minutes uh, we will take you through some of the quick demonstrations of um, uh, sap conversational ai platform uh, with a whatsapp and web chat channel uh, obviously with current situations um, Uh, we have seen a lot of uh, surge uh, in the demand from our customers to accelerate the business processes whether they are uh, the core financial procurement or sales operations or it is collaboration with customers dealers transporters or suppliers so how we can embed whatsapp channel or a voice uh, bot to uh, to have a seamless collaboration with all the stakeholders so that is where uh, we have some of the uh, demonstrations for today uh, and we would love to work with you for more customized scenarios as per your actual requirements right so this is sap conversational ai platform which is chat and voice bot uh, based process automation and uh, we have taken some of the examples i will quickly run you through the uh, the storyboard which i will demonstrate uh, in next few minutes 
so one of the persona which we have taken is a dealer or retailer persona right and he is a owner of petrol station right and his deliveries have been affected uh, because of current covid situation so is bit worried about maintaining the balance between demand and supply right and uh, he wants to see that will my order reach on time so he identifies a lockdown in an area right and he uh, immediately accesses the bot which has been given to him over whatsapp and web chat channel and he asks for the order status and then bot will reply with the status of order right uh, the second uh, option is how uh, orders are doing in terms of whether they are blocked or whether they have been released uh, for the delivery aspect right so uh, they can also ask as a dealer or retailer about uh, order status along with uh, if there are any block orders uh, and if it is blocked due to overdue payments that can be also highlighted right uh, uh, they can also uh, ask the bot about contract expiring so if there are any specific contracts which are expiring and therefore they have to be renewed as well so that can be done over a bot in tight integration with the back end sap systems right uh, and obviously how dealer or retailer can also do a order management uh, they can look at their account statement they can look at their open invoices using whatsapp channel or using a web chat channel which is embedded within the dealer portal or a retailer portal right so that is also something which we are going to briefly talk about another persona is a transporter and uh, here the transporter is uh, again um, uh, responsible to ensure that all the fleet operations are on time and uh, there are no uninterrupted uh, scenarios so obviously as a transporter i want to check on various operation aspects and i can uh, look uh, for bot to automate this process using whatsapp channel i can ask various questions like where are my trucks what is the next payment right what is my payment status are there any vehicle licenses which are expiring right or uh, how i can do better using machine learning capabilities which are also embedded within our chatbot platform right how uh, i can get intelligent insights about my delivery time so that i can further rectify the bottlenecks and and improve the overall uh, operations right uh, so this is a quick uh, architecture view of uh, sap uh, conversational ai with whatsapp bot running on sap cloud platform right uh, so here you can see that there could be various uh, input channels uh, for the dealers or retailers or for transporters which could be a web chat which could be a whatsapp chat right uh, for whatsapp channel we also leverage twilio package which is Uh, uh, a package to ensure that there is a seamless integration between whatsapp and sap conversational ai platform so all these input channels whether it's a mobile app whether it's a portal or it's a whatsapp channel right they will be integrated via bot connector to sap conversational ai platform and all the inputs from the dealers retailers or the other stakeholders that will be converted into a specific format and using the dialog engine which includes natural language processing uh, right and it includes all the intents entities uh, through which we have trained the bot right so it will process all the input from the end users within this dialog engine right and then uh, this information will be passed on to the bot logic which is which is residing in uh, let's say a uh, application runtime layer and uh, it will go to the back end sap system to fetch the necessary information so the back end system could be an erp system or it could be an s4 hana system right and it will get the information uh, and there will be a secure tunnel between this cloud environment and the on premise system right which is using cloud connector the cloud connector will sit on top of your on premise landscape over and above your dmz and this will create a secure ssl vpn tunnel between on prem and cloud to ensure that entire identity propagation entire data movement that happens through this secure tunnel only so your business data is residing in your business systems which could be erp systems which could be crm systems which could be transportation management systems whereas the entire response will flow in via the secure tunnel and then again using bot connector we will deliver the response to the respective channels which could be web channel or a mobile app channel or a whatsapp channel right so this was a quick uh, architecture view obviously it can be further customized based on your actual requirements now what i will do is i will take you through a quick uh, demonstration so let me just uh, 
very so we need a small question probably uh, this can also be extended for suppliers also right not only for customers absolutely it could be any process procure to pay order to cash it could be asset management scenarios it could be procurement scenarios employee self service scenarios so we have many such examples uh, of customer deployments as well which we'll be happy to share uh, yes as part of today's demo we have just taken uh, dealer retailer and the transporter persona yeah thanks thanks anish right so uh, so let me just very quickly as uh, log in into my uh, whatsapp so you can see this is my whatsapp and i have a, a dealer bot i hope my screen is visible right sandeep it's visible dina it's visible okay it's perfect visible. perfect right so as a, a dealer or a retailer i am using whatsapp channel here and uh, i can let's say start my conversation you can also have an authentication process with one time password approach or with with a username password kind of an uh, approach as well wherein you can also leverage let's say native mobile app capabilities uh, right uh, with face recognition or touch id as a multi layer of authentication right uh, so again in this case i am uh, so i have started the conversation bot has replied how i can help you today do you want to know about your order status block orders or order history account balance or contract expiry so i will say that order his uh, let's say order status right so bot will give an response uh, order number this is scheduled for delivery and dispatched on so and so date similarly order this is under loading and another order is which is a return order is also scheduled so based on the back end integration with the erp system it will fetch all the details and via conversational ai channel the information will be delivered on whatsapp right right similarly let's say i want to look at block orders so i can also uh, put a query on blocked orders so bot will again reply with any of the orders which are blocked so with a order number that this is blocked for credit due due to overdue checks and 3 uh, days overdue payments for x amount of uh, rupees right uh, i can also ask for let's say any contract expiry so i can also do that okay so if there are any contracts uh, which are getting expired so yes it will fetch the record from the back end and say that contract for furnace oil is getting expired on so and so date would you like to request for an extension i will say yes right and uh, this will go ahead and it will put an extension request uh, with a specific sales office uh, and the, this will be integrated with the back end erp system right uh, similarly what i can do is i can also uh, have a quick view of how i can place the orders right so let me also very quickly show you that and this we did for one of the automotive company obviously this can be done for any industry so let's say i want to start my interaction for placing the orders okay so i have i have started the interaction here and it will ask me for one time authentication maybe an otp or a six digit passcode so i can quickly enter that uh, and once i have done with the authentication i can start uh, entering the uh, options which are uh, presented by bot so in this case bot has given me three options place order show account statement and show open invoices so let's say i say place order okay so moment i say place order it will give me certain options like uh, since it's an automotive scenario it has given me two divisions truck or non truck i say truck i can simply put number like 1 and i want to do a, a order placement for a truck scenario then it says select the category so i say radial uh, tire for example i can also type in and uh, it will further narrow down the options what is a tire pattern i can say lug okay uh, which is one of the tire pattern and uh, then it will further ask me the fitment position i will say all wheel fitment number 1 and uh, with this it can also ask me for the load whether it is heavy load or a moderate load so you can further customize this demo as per your industry requirements this is just an example uh, to show you that how the order placement can also happen with the back end sap and i can also specify the quantity now let's say two quantities so it will uh, go ahead and give me the rate uh, from the back end with the pricing information i say yes uh, please place the order and uh, with this uh, it will go ahead and place the order in the back end sap 
and this order information will be visible in the chat bot right so you can see the order number is 231941 which is coming from the back end erp if you want uh, you can also go and check in your back end erp system and this order will be created right uh, similarly i can check for let's say show account statement right so i can also check my account statement as well and you can also uh, have a comprehensive visibility of your opening closing balance uh, the total credits or debits that can be also visualized so these are some of the key transactions which any dealer would want to do on a frequent basis and uh, typically there is a low adoption of dealer portal or a retailer portal so in such scenarios whatsapp channel is very helpful right wherein people can uh, perform their important transactions so this uh, bot has replied with the open invoices that you have 10 open invoices as of today and if you want you can also include banking payment integration that can be also done with a, a web link uh, which can be embedded within a mobile app that will be also feasible right uh, so similarly i can also show you a very quick one on the transporter side uh, so let's say i join as a uh, as a transporter okay so let me very quickly do that so there are certain uh, pass codes which we have maintained so let me just very quickly log in as a transporter so i come into a transporter persona now okay and uh, bot will give me an response how can i help do you want to know shipment status shipment history payment status contract status right so i can say shipment status for example and uh, in this case uh, it will give me a shipment status that shipment number this uh, is under loading similarly another shipment is released from the terminal right so this information can come from the transportation management systems uh, any sap non sap systems can be integrated uh, conversational ai as a platform it is uh, uh, back end agnostic so you can use it for both sap as well as non sap backends right and uh, similarly i can say let me also look at uh, the payment status for example so i can look at the payment status as a transporter so there is a some accrual which is there for a given period and there are some deductions which are there and uh, payment scheduled run is uh, there on 5th of august so that is how it has responded i can also look for any vehicle license expiry for example right so it can also help me with uh, any details of vehicle license expiry like what two of my vehicles there is a license expiry which is coming on so that is also something which it has responded and there is a calibration certificate which is also expiring on a given date so it has also responded with all the inputs which are required on a day to day basis to a transporter right uh, what i will very quickly do, uh, do is also show you the similar stuff over a, a quick uh, dealer portal so a chatbot which is embedded within a dealer portal i hope uh, you can see my screen uh, sandeep if you can confirm yeah it's visible okay so as you can see this is a dealer portal uh, and uh, in this case and you you already might have some dealer portal which could be running on premise or on cloud you can also embed sap conversational ai as part of your dealer or customer portals right uh, and here this can also give you voice response while in whatsapp it's a pure text based chat but if if you go to the web chat scenarios you can also enable voice bots so i will also uh, very quickly show you this so let's say i start my conversation hi there when you are ready to log into tire automotive please enter your six digits passcode to begin so as you can see i am entering a text input and uh, in response i am getting a voice output thanks john how can i help you for quick access choose one of the options below 1 place order 2 show account statement 3 show open invoices right so i can have the similar conversation as i did on whatsapp over a web chat which has voice bot as well Here is your account statement as of today. Opening balance: two thousand United States dollars and one cent. Total debits: two thousand three hundred and seventy-four United States dollars. Total credits: eight hundred and seventeen United States dollars. Closing balance: three. Right. So I wanted to very briefly show you this. You can continue on uh, with the voice bot with all the other options like placing the order, looking at the open invoices, and so on. 
so yes voice bot option is also very much feasible right uh, if you go in web chat channel or some other channels uh, with whatsapp it will be a text based uh, input and output uh, as we have seen in the in the previous demonstration so uh, over to you sandeep this is what i briefly wanted to cover if there are any specific questions we can we can address it uh, right away yeah yeah before uh, i take the questions one question from my side uh, is there any way that we can also do some sort of a on schedule uh, push type of scenario where in certain say uh, things notifications gets pushed to uh, those channels whatsapp and others yeah so we do have uh, certain uh, capabilities uh, and again uh, they also belong to some of sap's partners as well uh, and we are doing some of the projects with a couple of customers um, in india as well wherein you can also send notifications uh, from your back end erp via whatsapp channel or other channels uh, so that is also possible and there are uh, specific capabilities like social channel 365 uh, which helps you in uh, sending sms or notifications uh, alerts via whatsapp channel which are integrated with the back end erp system that is also feasible yeah so one question is there from uh, ravi uh, ravi uh, the sir has asked that can we send attachment also as for example payment advice so this is a question uh we do have some solutions around it obviously it will be not addressed through the chatbot or uh, voice bot platform but if you want to have uh, document attachment uh, and you want to uh, automate your outbound communications let's say it's a it's a customized bill or it's a uh, customized uh, uh, payment advices uh, right uh, which you want to send to your customers which are automatically generated from the back end erp system and then distributed via multiple channels like email or uh, sms so yes we do have an option for it uh, it is not part of sap conversational ai platform uh, but i remember i guess uh, some of our gas customers uh, they have they have been using this solution called uh, sap document presentment okay which basically helps you in automating your all outbound communications right which could be personalized customer bills or personalized marketing offers right which are generated from the back end erp or the crm systems and then uh, you can further customize and you can uh, distribute them via sms email channel which will include attachments as well so in fact one of the i i cannot take the name but one of the uh, customer in the gas industry they have been using this sap document presentment solution okay and uh, and is there any way integration uh, is possible between say rpa and uh, conversational ai i mean absolute type of question yeah yeah, yeah absolutely so highlight. conversational conversational ai and rpa as well as machine learning all work hand in hand and uh, let's say i am creating an order from a chat bot which is which could be whatsapp or a web channel and uh, once i have done the order placement then that order can be ultimately posted automatically into back end erp using an rpa bot right uh, so that could be one example similarly if you are receiving uh, let's say any of uh, uh, incoming emails which you want to integrate uh, with and you want to capture the data from emails and post it into your sap system then also you can leverage rpa plus machine learning put together so yes i mean depending on the actual scenarios you can leverage these three technologies uh, hand in hand that is very much possible i suncho niche oshu deshe Okay, Sandeep. Yeah. So thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Vinay. Is there any questions for Vinay? Uh, just wanted to highlight if there if there is any scenario which you want to basically, if you have any scenario which you want uh, SAP to work and collaborate, then we are uh, we always welcome that. And so, uh, Sandeep, uh, I th I think Ravi sir has this question. I think which you asked. Uh, so I have already responded. Maybe uh, uh, Ravi sir, what we will do is we will connect with you on SAP document presentment solution uh, for automating your outgoing communication, including attachments and all. Uh, we can have one detailed session with you on that. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, uh, uh, Vinay. And uh, we again, uh, I think. Uh, is there if there is no other question then the, i would uh, invite uh, manoj to come and conclude the event and uh, let me also switch on the mentimeter while manoj is uh, just closing it yeah manoj please
हेलो मनोज मनोज हेलो मनोज Okay, I'll, I'll ask him to unmute through Zoom command. Let's see. Meanwhile, we can ask Mr. Vikas Prabhu to add anything if he wants. Ah, uh, Vikas uh, sir has uh, sent me a separate message that he had okay. to log out. Ah, uh, otherwise, if Not able to. Yeah. Um, yeah, Manoj, you are there. Yeah. Yes, I'm there. Yeah. Yeah, Manoj. So we have uh, ended the session of Vinay. So if you can kindly conclude. Maybe Vikas is there. Vikas Prabhu. Ah, uh, Vikas sir had just uh, had to uh, log out because he just she had told me. That he had okay. 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 Yeah. Okay. So uh, I hope you know we enjoyed these sessions. and i uh, would like to thank all the members uh, who participated sparing their valuable time uh, in our special interest group uh, uh, maybe uh, i don't know uh, whether the next session would allow us to meet in person maybe we will try to uh, uh, engage personally on the next uh, sig otherwise i think after 3 months uh, maybe we'll conduct another virtual session so on behalf of indus special interest group would like to thank all the members and uh, team sap who uh, along uh, with our board member vikas you know who made it possible so once again thank you very much all thanks a lot okay thank you everyone some technical issues i am not able to connect to mentimeter but i will share the questions uh, please do give your candid answers it will help so thanks a lot thank you okay yeah. thank you manoj ji thanks everyone bye thank you nikhil thank, thank you bye thanks a lot चलो ना और कॉल कर सकते हैं वो मार्केट कार्ड का नहीं है बिल का नहीं है